Hello, everyone. It's Dave. Real quick, before we get the episode started, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is, at the end of this episode, after a couple hours, the episode seems to end. And I'll have some, uh, some things to say about the episode, and then there'll be the end credit music. And then there's like another hour of show. So John and I just kept talking. He turned the tables on me a little bit, started asking me questions, and uh, we just kept going because we like to talk to each other. And there's some real fun stuff in there. So if you uh, feel like you want to keep going, there's a lot of uh, content in this episode. So um, that'll be there for you. The other thing that I wanted to say is this episode is brought to you today by the books of Boris Schleinkofer. All right. That's going to take some explaining. So Boris is a guy that I have known for many years, and Boris has been involved with things that I've done over the years. Uh, I put out a tape comp with my zine years ago in 1993, and he was in a band called Outside, and they were on that. And he's been a, an influential guy in my life since junior high. So I haven't had a chance to have him on the show yet, but I'm going to. But Boris has been writing and releasing books and if any of you that are listening to this remember Boris from school, if any of the people that knew Boris, I, I'm sure that doesn't come as a huge surprise. Uh, it's something I would have always expected, and they are great. They are definitely from a, a specific perspective. They deal with aliens and conspiracies, government, behind-the-scenes kind of stuff, dark, twisted. Like, it's almost Lovecraftian. So, what I wanted to mention was he just released his first audiobook that he narrated. It's called Eschatopolis, City at the End of the World. And it's an interesting book among his books because it serves to tell some of the stories from his life that inspired him to write some of the stuff that he's written. So it's cool because it's got a continuation of some of the stuff he's written about in his other books, but it also kind of has almost like I mean, I don't want to say justification because he doesn't have to justify what he writes, but definitely like, you know, reasons and kernels for the stories that he has done so far. And it's very cool. Certainly, if you like listening to podcasts, you know, books on tape are not a long way off from that. So I'm going to go ahead at the end of the episode. I'm going to throw a clip from Boris's book, a sample of his audio book in his voice. So we'll put that in right after the, uh, the episode notes and before the bonus content. The deal is you can get his book free, basically, if you sign up for Audible. I'm going to put a link on the webpage for this episode on nobody'snose.com. If you click that link, you can get Boris's book. I believe they'll give you another book for free and like a 30-day trial. You've got to sign up. It's like anything. And it's just like anything. You can cancel it, you know, in a month. I mean, come on. They're trying to get customers, right? They're trying to get new subscribers. But it's cool. And it's, you know, it's no trick. Get Boris's book, pick another book. If there's a book that you've been wanting to read or wanting to listen to, you can grab that. And then maybe you'll want to stay on. Maybe you'll enjoy the service and keep going with it. So definitely go click on that link on the website if you're interested and check it out. I think you'll dig it. All right, let's get into this episode. Episode number 30 of I've Known You Too Long. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to I've Known You Too Long. So, it's episode 30, and I made a promise. I said that for episode 30, I was going to have John Pettibone back to do part two of his podcast, because we did not get done. So, he's here. Ding -a -ding. We're back! <laughs> wow, so that was solid red in the recording. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it's going to sound, Whoa. but we're going to go with it. How are so you, So red. Good, how are you, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm going to have to do some level Sorry adjusting. Sorry if I just blew here. ears. No, I think it's okay. I'm just starting to do a level Ray Capo. <laughs> Ray Capo, we're not in this lone intro. <laughs> <laughs> that that works. That's sure, really good. Not? You're back. I am back. Okay. So, and you're back. And I'm back. It's been a while. I haven't done You know what? We've never, of... we haven't gone anywhere. But you mean we've been sitting here for two and a half years? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> so so the thing that is strange We've is been that thinking about it for two and a half years. You were on... Episode 24, obviously, mm -hmm. because the 24th letter of the alphabet is X. The X. And now you're back for episode 30. And you would think that it wouldn't take six, well, five episodes, because this would be the sixth, to go two and a half years. Yeah. And you'd be right. There were yeah. one or two half-step episodes in there. Yeah. 
but it's not more than seven. Not yeah. more than seven episodes. Yeah, Greg's been on like seven times since then. It's awesome. <laughs> Greg's been on a total of three times. <laughs> Love you, Greg. <laughs> Damien, I think, and Greg. I think Damien, oh, Damien and Greg have been the same true. amount. 17 times. And I need cool. to get both of them back over again for together. I like it. <laughs> that Ooh, would be great. You, you think I should have a check-in with both of them? Yes. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder when the last time they've crossed paths. Who knows? Yeah. Probably like last year or something. Probably yesterday. It's, yeah, you never know. At a coffee shop. So, um, yeah, it's been, life has been weird. Mm-hmm. There has been a lot going on and it has kept me from doing podcast episodes as much as I've wanted to. But um, I got the room cleared out again. Believe it or not, the place you're sitting was stacked all the way to the ceiling like one day ago. With what? Just boxes of garbage. Not garbage. Stuff I sell on eBay and yeah. various other. We had a couple more people move into this house. Whoa. Um, I didn't my class family members. Oh. And because of that, there has been always been activity and a lot of the space that was here has shrunk, which yeah. is fine. It had to happen. For sure. It's family. But, exactly. Mm-hmm. But it's made it very difficult to do podcasting from here. I bet. So a couple things. I can actually do my podcast mobile, so I'm going to start trying to take it to some other people here there and there. Go. And uh, also- I have a man cave in my house, so if you want to- Oh, do you? If you need it. It's got some stuff in it. <laughs> you're offering space don't offer me space i could fill up space <laughs> pretty fill good yeah um but you know i'm just i'm getting it back on track like you're sitting in front of the microphone everything's set right back here. up no one else is here in the house right no. now not even michael and unfortunately just you and I. I know i know well you had your fill of her last time not enough <laughs> oh it's creepy listen to that <laughs> only her i listened back to your episode to get ready for this one mm-hmm. and you and it was horrible well you know you know how many times you go so hot <laughs> seven times <laughs> i think that might be the number all right <laughs> it's a theory wait it's a theory yeah seven why not it's a magic number always so we were totally peaking everything and now everything's gotten quiet on the i am worried about it but uh-huh. It's going to be okay. Should we just start over? No. If the um, audio is bad on this one, <laughs> it's just going to be bad because you, you're going to have to really be a, a petty moan yeah. completionist to want to know what's going on here. Okay. Yeah. So we don't have to do the I've known you too long. Well, we'll call this one I've known you even longer. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't have to figure out. We know where we met. We met in Lenny's basement. Second uh, Brotherhood show, Bremerton. Yeah. Yeah. We figured that out last time. Talked a lot about your love for Freddie Mercury. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Lee and I went and saw Queen what, last year. With, oh, you did? Uh, yeah, with Adam Lambert singing, and it was awesome. It's at the Kirina. Wow. So good. Really? Yeah. Okay, I would think without, without and him. And we even had nosebleed seats, and I was like, it's going to sound horrible in there, but whatever. We, we, we need to go, and it was it sounded so amazing. I've seen bad shows in there, and I've seen good shows in there. When you're in, uh, a, lot in a good shows show. In there. A lot of bad shows. Oh, yeah. Dude, we saw. Did you ever do sh- go to shows at the uh, hockey arena that was down there? No. What was it? The what was oh, it called? but like Danzig played there. Oh, well, yeah, we saw Soundgarden. The, the, we saw Sick of It All and Civ play there in Warp Tour '94. Uh, we, were out, we were out on tour when that. Well, you that came through. Yeah. Oh, okay, Undertow was out. Um, a lot of fights at that one with your friends. And, yeah, my friends. Well, my start, friends don't fight. Starting them or finishing them, I can't remember what it was. We always but... finish them. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was yeah. outdoor and indoor. So Quicksand was outside, and then Sick of It All and Civ were inside. Oh, strange. And it was Warp Tour. I, I feel Orange like... Nine was on that, right? Too. Yeah. Wasn't it a bunch yeah. of New York bands? It was either. It was ninety five, I think. Was it the f- second Warp tour ever, or first? Could have been the first one. Oh wow! I don't know. Incredible. I've only ever been to one, maybe. Mm. I think. But yeah, you guys were probably on tour or something. Yeah, that's rad. <laughs> yeah, I remember the arena had. Oh, anyways, going back to Key Arena, but the old hockey arena saw social distortion. They did the Gotcha Grind. Did you go to that? Nope. No. Oh. Bill went to that. Oh, it's so rad. I still have a, a Batman shirt with Steve Caballero's signature on it. Nice. Incredible. I just pulled it out. Like, I was at my folks and found a box of stuff. Open it up, and it's like, uh, you know, child pictures of me and the family and whatnot. And then at the very bottom was, like, a couple old shirts. Like, the green undertow shirt that was only oh yeah like 24 made, I think. The Gatorade with, one. Yeah, with my parents' phone number at the bottom of it. <laughs> Assholes. <laughs> I didn't do it. I know, but I we know who did it. <laughs> and uh, so there was one of those in it. I was psyched. And then um, that Batman with the Steve Caballero signature on oh, it. Fantastic. Yeah, I know. I think I might frame it. That's Why a good not? idea. You know. Ooh, you know what I did do? So my... 
let's not call it man cave. Let's call it my hideout. <laughs> um, I found the Lenny basement flyer, the brotherhood set list from it. And um, there was three things. Oh, the there's a, a silk screen, the silk screen of the brotherhood with the four of them lined up that they had on the, they have it on a shirt. The brotherhood of friends demo cover. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I just hit the mic, punching things. Hold on. Do the yes again. Yes. <laughs> Let's do it like it's real. Yes! <laughs> Sorry, ears. <laughs> I, I still don't have a usable yes. We're just going to go with the one where you hit the, yes. the, you hit the stand. Okay. Uh, um, At least it's real. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. But it's a bigger print of it. Okay, yeah. And I think Ron must have given it to me or something, but I put it, I framed that and put it up in the room. Nice. So psyched on it. So psyched. Very cool. I know. Anyways, we're wasting people's time. No, this is, well, this, listen, there's an argument that this podcast is a waste of people's time. <laughs> no way. Yeah. I, no. You'd have to care. I mean, you know what I mean? I, there's people that love it that don't live here. No, no, I, I get, I get good you feedback get, on good. it. That's and awesome. sometimes I've, I've talked to people who have, don't know who I am or don't know who mm-hmm. the people who have found the podcast and who have enjoyed it, which is great. Mm. But still, you have to be looking for a certain kind of thing. We're going to, so much of this stuff, we're just talking. Yeah. Whatever. But it's life. It's it life. is. You it's hear memories. About, you hear about people's life. Yeah. You know? So what we're doing is we, we left off. There's a point, maybe 20 minutes before the end of your first episode, mm-hmm. where we decided to stop talking about what you were talking about, which was getting into Undertow. Mm-hmm. And we decided to jump ahead and talk about what you're doing now, at, which okay, was yeah. two, which was two and a half years ago. And we decided to save all of those stories for number thirty. Yes. Number thirty people because it's Roman numeral XXX. Duh. Because John gets the twenty four and the thirty. Because mm-hmm. that's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> Straight edge. Straight edge. It's awesome. It really is. <laughs> so. Do you want to talk about anything else before we jump into? Do you have any pressing? news or issues that you want to do before we jump back into that because we'll get I oh i know you're trying we'll to right do no there's no news that i have at all oh you know what i'm trying to do do you uh-huh. think i know about something that, maybe oh huh they'll have to wait i'm not even sure what you're talking about um yeah me neither <laughs> <laughs> oh cryptic the funny thing is so, oh well all the guys will be in town in a few weeks all the guys undertow oh wait all the but there's not and a, we can all hang there's out no and do se- this. there's no secret undertow show happening i mean there might be in a garage don't you'll you'll get that. the text. Are you kidding me? You'll get the text message. You aren't really good. That's, Murph doesn't I, even have a drum set. <laughs> Do you know how many shows I've seen where bands were playing on borrowed equipment? Don't say Murph doesn't have a drum set. I think I did that. one two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Looking like an old man. <laughs> yep. Oh, God. At a dive bar, and it was amazing. Yeah, he was playing a dive bar. So fun. A couple of weeks ago. Yep. Lizzie came over. Loose, and Loose chili. You guys were called Loose Chili that yeah. night. That's right. Uh-huh. Lizzie came over and showed me a video she had taken of me from across the room. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, just erase that. It's awful. <laughs> I'm an old man and I am not up for this yeah. late night fucking was late. rock band shit. Was I'm late. old. Tired. Um, but it was still awesome. It was fun. And I just don't want a video of it, of me. Yeah. I want a video of you guys. Yeah. It was cool. Good it time. was good. Good time. So I think that's unfair to tease people the idea that there's going to be a secret undertow show. And that isn't what we were talking about. No. It's not what we're talking about, <laughs> but it would be cool. So I'm going to try. We don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, we're going to try to see if there's a way we could record with all of you guys. Mm-hmm. I don't really have the equipment for that, um, but we'll figure it out. It's going to be a mess. Excuse me. You, you might all have to talk into one microphone. Yeah, it's just, we're going to just be laughing. <laughs> Story laughs. Story laughs. Anyways. Okay, so why don't we just uh, why don't we jump into it here? Sure. You had just said that they handed you a bass and said, "Play bass." Yeah. And then you were in undertow. Yeah, because I was I drove the guys to their Spokane show with Brotherhood mm-hmm. and for or uh, better off, better off. Yeah, I didn't get to go. Spokane hardcore. You didn't get to go to that one. No, but if you have the better off seven inch, all the pictures in the seven inch were taken at that show, and you can clearly see Julie. Yeah. In those pictures, mm-hmm. I think maybe Kirsten and Bill Baker are taking photos on the other side of the oh, stage yeah. of whoever it was that took yeah. the photos. Yeah. And it's unmistakable. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that was, then of course I had to look at that and go, well, there's a show I didn't get to go to. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. It was super fun. So I drove those guys because I was by then 16, license, had a Ford Escort. You got your license through it. They were borrowing gear and drove across to Spokane and played. It was, it was super fun. And I, I think 
That but was... you didn't play. No, no. I was like just there, tag along, Brody, whatever, whatever you called it back then. But um, I th- was that Brotherhood's last show, I guess? Or I don't know. Because I don't know the timeline because they did that accused splattered straight tour. Right. They played in Bremerton. That was the one where Wrecking Crew happened to be in town and, mm-hmm. and jumped on and played and was incredible. Nice. Um, were you at that one? No. No. Oh, shoot. No. I so saw Brotherhood I one time and you were there. The Inlandies Basement. Mm-hmm. Wow. You only saw Brotherhood one time? Yeah. Wow. The other, I, okay. They were supposed to go out and play in Bellingham with when I was in that band, Ad Odds. Oh, yeah. And that they it got shut down shut before down. they could play. Yeah. Feeding the Cause played. Oh my God, from Issaquah. And they were great. <laughs> Insane. They I, were, st- I see Evan still. Oh, do you really? A, a lot. I, I love running into those old dudes. Once in a while, I'll run in. James wasn't in the band. He was just an Issaquah dude. Okay. But I think. I'm not, I don't quite remember. But running into Evan. Evan, there was a band in Issaquah, a straight edge band called Feeding the Cause, like same time as Refuse and Brotherhood was going. Um, and they played a couple shows and had a demo. And then I remember know, thinking that, all... that show in the store space in Bellingham, they were so good. Oh, they were so good. That guy is a great guitar player and he, he plays, he's in what boss Martians. He's been doing that for like 20 years. And oh, okay. like he does like this European circuit of, uh, like garage rock. He's super huge in the garage rock like scene. Oh, crazy. It's crazy. But it's fun when me and him see each other, it's just talking. Nice. You know, 1989. It's amazing. So, Anyways, so the cops or the the space owner, someone showed up right at the end of Feeding the Cause and it all got shut down. They didn't uh-huh. get to play. So, and then Dang. there was another time I, I couldn't, I wasn't old enough. And for some reason I got targeted at the door and couldn't get in to see them when they played with seven seconds on the air. Oh. Earth. And under, everybody got into that show. Everybody got into that show. Yeah. I did not get in. Wow. The people I was with from Bellingham, we didn't get in. None. Just oh. got down there too late or... They were, something out? had happened. There was a dude working the door, this big skinhead dude. And oh, we, yeah. As we Sean st- the skinhead. Sure. Total dickhead. And as we stepped up, he looked at our group and he, he said, don't even show me an ID if it doesn't say you're 18. Oh, he's like, okay. he's like, don't test me. Yeah. Don't put an ID in front of my face yeah. that says you're. And so a bunch of us were just like, kind of looking at him. And he's like, nope, leave. Yeah. Just yeah. leave. So we walked. Cause yeah. Couldn't get in. No. Oh, and we, that's a bummer. The whole week, we thought, yeah. like, we were like, we'd go around the back and try to either get in the thing mm-hmm. with people we knew, and it yeah. just didn't happen. Yeah. Like, it was so disheartening and such a bummer. Yeah. Was- that, that club throat goes back to the connection I had with this goth girl, and her brother worked there before hardcore came in, and so I always had this connection at the underground, so I got to sneak in to a lot of things. Yeah. Sorry. No, oh, it just didn't happen. You know, Whatever. Yeah. It just but, was meant to but, be. And there was... You know, we we went and did a bunch of other we, Seattle shit because yeah, we were from Bellingham, yeah. and it's like, okay, well, it's, awesome. it still sucks. Yeah, I would have liked it. To does. Yeah. Well, to jump ahead ten years later, that guy got his ass beat. So, <laughs> oh, you know, wait, at one, it was all for you now. At one, he got his ass beat by someone you know. Yeah, he's in this room, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a couple friends. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that dude was a dick. No. Oh. Yeah. Well. Oh well. I don't know who he is. He's gone. <laughs> Long gone. Six feet deep. Wait, he's dead. Yeah. Oh, he was a huge drug addict, and unfortunately, but you're not implying that you beat him to death. Oh gosh, no, 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 no. That's never happened, ever. Um, wow, that's so no, that guy because he, he worked so there. He worked there almost that... the entire time the underground. Because I used to go. That thing is going right. Oh, yeah, like I'm gonna crazy. say something crazy. Back off your mic a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You're okay. Good. Yeah. You're just you're loud tonight, which is good. Most people Ooh. are too quiet. You're good. Psyched. Um. We're way off topic. It doesn't matter. Uh, that guy. That yeah, guy. Yeah. He's a typical bouncer. You didn't. And you're, I, I, he'd been there for. You weren't trying through, to imply that you killed him. No, never. Okay. I did not kill the bouncer at the underground. <laughs> Sean the skinhead. Oh, God. <laughs> no, he had overdose or something years mm-hmm. and years ago. Because he was a bouncer there. When then, after shows, it was just a goth club. Mm-hmm. And me and my buddies would go there, go dancing and whatnot. And, uh, um, he was always there. He's always a dickhead and whatnot. And, but he was super into like, I think meth and, you know, that was his path. Anyways, Bummer. Yeah. But let's roll back. Oh yeah. Roll back. Okay. You're, so, so you're getting in the band. They handed you a bass and said, play it. I think we covered a little bit of the beginning, but then we stopped it. So yeah. let's just, we'll yeah. just start from there. Yeah. Tell me how it happened. Phew, I don't remember. The, Ron, how it Ron happened. gave me a bass. Meaning and... how did you become the bass player for Undertow? Okay. So those guys are gone. They had a bass player named Josh in the band. And, you know, young back then, Josh, I believe, wasn't straight edge anymore. And I think Mark kicked him out. Ryan kicked him out. Someone. 
he wasn't buddies with anyone anymore and he was done he was out and i had by then i'd gotten real tight with those guys and i think ron and mark or someone had a conversation and was just like oh give pettybone the bass and ron had a bass and he gave me the bass and mark showed me how to play the notes <laughs> and that was and it huh? and undertow was born <laughs> Now, that wasn't the base that Damien ended up using. I don't think so. Okay. It's not the one that's Maybe under, under the house here. For real? Oh, when Damien came here to do his episode, we took a photo. We recreated the cover of At Both Ends outside oh on the patio. God. Look on the- I'll look it up. Look on the page if for you... his podcast episode and you'll oh, see that. So, yeah. So, underneath the house might be the Ron base. I don't know. It's, oh. the, uh, it's, I, the, it's I, the base that I ended Damien... up buying a base. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened to it. It may not be the wrong bass. It's just the bass that, that yeah. Damien played and the one that ended up being on the I cover of Apple Fans. Oh, shoot. It's a prized possession, man. That doesn't not, work That's or incredible. Anything. Who cares? Put it on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the man cave on the wall? Exactly. It's not a man cave, Dave. Uh, it's a, a hideout. A hideout. Wait. Is it, it's not a secret hideout because people know about it. Nah, he knows where it is. It's just up the stairs. So I had a root. We had um, a you close put, friend. Would you put it on the wall? Heck yeah! You would mount that base on the I wall. I would mount that next to the Brotherhood framed everything. And what else is there? There's a Hemsa skate deck. A you take, Mis- Misfits Madrid skate you take deck. A, you take a picture of it and send it back to me to put on a on the page. Sure. All right. You take the base with you tonight. I'll have to find it. The trick is though, you have to put it on the wall. And yeah. then you got to take a photo so I can no, see send it. it to yeah. Okay. Because it has to, I mean, what's it doing here? You know, if you have a is place really underneath for the it, house, mm-hmm. oh. it might be in the garage. Is it in the case? Yeah. Oh, okay. That same old case. Wow. Trashed. But that's the base that's on at yeah. both ends? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's so cool. Wow. Yeah. It's, when we get done with this, I'll take a look at, I'm going to repost okay. it now because we've talked about okay. it. I'll repost it on the page okay. for yours, but the, the okay. Damien recreation. I'll I'll get one of the at both ends and I'll frame that too. And I'll put it next to it and then it's like, nice. you know, then it makes sense. Yeah. Sure. Okay. You'll have Funny. a whole thing. Yeah. Nostalgia. I love that. That's what I should turn the hideout into. It's well, it kind of nos- already is. It's a nostalgia hideout. It is. Because yeah. actually there's an incredible vintage toy store up in Everett and I found a toy that I had when I was five. John, yeah. Matt Motswilk and I went to that toy store two days ago. Isn't it incredible? And it was the first time either one of us had seen it. I'm, I am spend like four hours it's called, just looking. It's called Bobacon. Bobacon. Incredible. Nice mm-hmm. people. I actually took... They wouldn't buy any of Matt's stuff. So <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't mean, but they weren't buying. Really? Yeah. I took a ton of stuff there two months ago. Yeah? So I started just shrinking down all my yeah. collections of stuff. And I just want to trade. That's what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And they took they took it. They gave me a great great deal. There's a life size sound wave in the corner. Did so you cool. lose your mind it's when so you saw insane. it? It's so insane. And I did you ask them where they got it? They don't tell you. Oh, the guy said we made it. For real? Yeah, that's what he told me. He said we made it. No, uh-huh. you think he did? Yeah, it's incredible. That store is the best for, vintage. For those of you that aren't life. weird old nerds, sound wave is the uh, transformer, the evil Decepticon transformer yep. that turned into a boombox in yep. the 1980s cartoon version. Yeah, so cool. And it, he was the coolest one. Yeah, Dude, they have everything there. They do. Mm-hmm. I I stood in the Star Wars section and just saw like so much of my childhood. Yep. And then looked around. I went and I said, "Where are the Micronauts?" <laughs> and they said, "We can't keep them in stock. We don't have any." Wow. He says they're gone as soon as we get them. Yeah. So they don't even have a section for Micronauts. Yeah. yeah. Which is that's cool. Yeah. They're the coolest ones. Yeah. Because I go up there. I make a trip up to Everett. Every two months, a friend of mine opened a really awesome coffee shop up there. And then there's Funko. Which Ever- is re- Everett's I mean, kind of happening. It is, right man. Now. It's blowing up. And um, Soto like, moved operations up there. And who would have known? You know, like there's show, there's, ki- there's kids throwing shows up there. So every once in a while, we get offered to play up there. And it just doesn't doesn't work out. But um, we played up there once. It was killer. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, that, that toy store. Uh, yeah, I went there and found a, a Voltron diecast metal <laughs> robot. And that was my first toy I remember at five that my grandfather gave me. And oh, I, wow. And I, so I was like, oh, I need that. Like, And the guy's so super it's a, cool. So it's a Shogun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I had Vol- a tall one, Voltron, too. Voltron, you still got to go ahead a few years. Yeah, yeah. The Shoguns are awesome. You, so got, a, you got a diecast Shogun. Yeah, it's about six inches tall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's killer. Do you remember the name of it? The name of the, the robot? Can you describe the color or any detail on it? It's like red, blue... Silver, obviously. Um, it's got the two yellow spinners on it on its shoulders, and then holding the red sword. 
Yellow spinners on the shoulders. Okay, I don't know which one the other one is. Ooh. It's not Mazenga. No. Okay. Man, you're way better than me. It's at this. not R- Radine. I don't no. know. There's a couple others I don't know. The way you describe that yeah. one, I don't know that one. But the guy there, I'm like, there's one toy I've been looking for for a long time, which is the Roddy Roddy Piper G.I. Joe. Oh. So hard to find. Really? Yeah. They didn't have it. He said he's never come across it, but he, since he, I'm the only person that's asked, he's like, I'll keep an eye out for it. What it about, I knew they made a Sergeant Slaughter. There's a Sergeant Slaughter up there, but I have that one. Yeah, that one? Yeah. I didn't know they made a Rowdy Rowdy Piper. Yeah, yeah. Very limited. Anyone out there want to trade? Let me know. Yeah, so let's. we're putting <laughs> out the call. Anyway. Need Rowdy Rowdy Piper, real American hero. Rest in G.I. peace. Yeah. Rest in peace. So yeah, you're I was, in, I was uh, handed a base. So you were handed a base. <laughs> That's the show. Uh, yeah, that's how we do it. Good night. <laughs> no, no, no. That's I mean, that's, no, not that's the show. Good night. Uh, this isn't four songs and we're out, John. Hey, which is what you like. I, it is. Twenty minutes set. Get me out of here. Call back to the last. So episode. great. So great. But no, this is going to be a little more than four songs. Yeah. Damn. My only Friday night off. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll do it quickly. Club. No. It is I nice. That all you the took time. a Friday night to come hang out with me yeah. in, a, in a hot Psyched. room. Psyched. With a neurotic dog outside that oh, won't look. He's doggy. a great little dog, but he's neurotic. He wants yeah. to be where I am. And it's a dog. I know. He makes too no, much noise. Hmm. They do. So, yeah, I was <laughs> handed the base. And uh, you said in the last we episode, we started up, you were changing the name from Refuse to Undertow. But there was a name in between. I don't. I don't. Mm, I don't think so. No? No. Not like Chimestone or something. Bridgestone. That's when Joel. <laughs> that you're jumping ahead like okay. a couple all years right, when right. Joel was right. getting the axe and we broke up. We'll, right, we'll right. get to that, anyways. But I want to say I I knew it wasn't uh, Chimestone. I think uh, Chimestone. <laughs> Fucking dickheads. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> we played a show and the first show I played, if I can remember right, was we were going to Olympia to see Galleon's Lap. Head first. Oh, we we did talk about this a little bit. Did we? Or did yeah, because head about first. It? We talked about head yeah, it was first. Head first. And whoever came up, it might have even been Amenity. Didn't no, we never played no? with Amenity. Amenity, I only ever saw Amenity once hmm. when they played the Washington Hall with Verbal Assault. Oh, okay. That show. Because Mark interviewed what a show. Um, them outside when Mark was doing a zine. And I just sat in listening. Um, yeah, that show was incredible. Like Verbal Assault. Holy cow. Whew. But yeah, in order, the first show I ever played, I think, was in Olympia. Okay. One of those other guys might, Mark or Ryan might and that know was, better. And you had four but songs, we, right? we weren't supposed to play. We were playing the next night in Seattle. Okay. Party Hall. Which I may have been at that one. But were we undertow then? Or was the band still refused? I, thought, I, don't as, I know. thought as soon as you were in the band... We changed the name. I thought so, but I don't know. Probably. I missed... I would like to say I was in Refuse for a day. Just to say it. <laughs> it could be. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but yeah, so that, Someone that's, can that's how it started. Clarify that. So, um, yeah, band didn't show up or something, and so we were all there. And I think Greg was like, Greg Anderson was like, hey, you guys are here. You know four songs. Can you play them? I was so scared. Sure, no problem. Did you know how to play them? Uh, Yeah, loosely. Yeah. But, I mean, you jump around. It's like, yeah, it was great. Played first. And you, then, don't, um, you don't remember what songs they were. Look Before You Leap. I think we just played Refuse songs. Okay. Or, who knows, Time Well Spent. Mm. Those are, that's a Refuse song. I don't know if we had written Cutting Away or anything like that yet. Or not me written, had written it, but those guys hadn't come up. I, I can't remember. I thought Time Well Spent was an Arto song. Was it? On the demo? Yeah, maybe. Could be. Who knows? Fuck. All I know is that you very I, quickly become I Undertale. I didn't prepare very well for this. That's fine. You uh, very quickly become Undertale. Yes. And then all of a sudden, and Undertale... And we started playing a lot. Yep. And people so started moving certain ways when you played. Mm-hmm. And it was awesome. Yeah, it was cool. It was definitely And I remember Val Undertale. Wonder calling it out like we were... Yeah, exactly. It was like a wave. It was like a... Yeah, it yeah. was like this dance thing. We all looked the same. Everyone was turning Turning point. Turning point shirts. Long sleeves. Head gaskets. Head gaskets. Camo shorts. Vans. <laughs> And you were uh, you were going nuts with the bass. So fun, a lot of good photos. Yeah, it's all <laughs> it's all was just photos. You, who knows if we, I was even playing? So here's maybe what I, I wasn't think, even plugged in. Well, well, then it means there's no bass, but that's fine. Mark yeah. actually could carry the could carry yeah. the show. But yeah. you guys became a band that could be photographed. And I think what happened, I think What's that, that mean? I mean there was something to actually any band can be photographed, but it's just 
guys standing there, right? Oh, playing okay. instruments, right? Yeah, yeah. You were action photo band. All you're a hardcore sudden. band. You were a hardcore band. Fuck. And I feel all like... I wanted to look like was Alex from Chain of Strength. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking awesome Slade, just jumping around. Yeah, poking the head out. Oh, so cool. Totally. And jumps. And then your energy. Everyone's feeding off your energy. It's all. It just became a thing, and it was great. It was fun. So just take it from there. You're basically going to start telling the story of your experience in Undertow. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as far as I can remember and recollect, uh, we just started playing a bunch of shows. And um, you and Ron, people are starting to, like, you guys take the torch, run with it. I don't know. Just, well, Ron was know. promoting everything. He yeah. He was writing the column yeah. in Maximum Rock and Roll. Yeah. He was doing, like, the scene report. Yeah. Um, That's true. And... He put one of the world's worst pictures of me ever. In the scene report? Well, which one's that? Uh, some picture of ad odds in Bellingham where I'm doing Ooh. some stupid jump and my lips are all like... like <laughs> he was like, look at that Madonna face. Wow. <laughs> what the Puckered. hell? <laughs> yeah, and then of course said it, and I was horrified that that yeah. picture existed and then he put it in a magazine. Yeah. Ouch. Forever. Yeah. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So we record a demo and... Um, I think after I did my parts and I left, Mark went back and redid the parts. Well, I've been told that happened with me, too, <laughs> yeah. with Die Down. I have no yeah. idea. Probably. <laughs> cool. Probably. Whatever. Probably sounds better. I think there are a lot of bands where that has happened. All of Mark's bands? Maybe. <laughs> Listen, it all sounds good. The recorded yeah. stuff, I mean, he, you know, yeah. I would trust Mark to do that sort For of sure. thing. For sure. And, you know, you hear stories about, like... Jump to Smashing Pumpkins, like Billy Corgan doing that. You know, yeah. he records everything and yeah. then the band just kind of plays it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't think he did the drums, yeah. but who knows? Hey, I tried. Yeah. So what I are did. you going to do? Yeah. I don't know that I heard that story. I just heard it about me <laughs> <laughs> and myself <laughs> years later. Um, oh, they didn't want you to know. They were trying to protect no, you. I guess. <laughs> I hurt my feelings. Who cares? So, what was like, okay, so. What ends up happening is, spoiler alert for everyone, John goes from playing bass to being the singer. Yeah. So, well, there's some cool stuff that happened. Oh, th there are. Up. So what I want so, to know are the significant events that happened in Undertow with you as the bass player. Yeah. We went on our first West Coast tour, and uh, the first one... Uh, did you guys hit a deer? I did. That was Wait, a couple years later. Okay. Um, when Lenny and Curtis Pitts drove us in Curtis's van. Okay. And I was driving, hitting deer. Oh, I deer. didn't know that was you. Yeah, that was me. It's Rough. always me hitting deers. It's such a bummer. Ooh. I, I think I've hit three or four on tours. Oh, my God. There's a lot of tours. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the first one was the guys still couldn't really drive yet. So, um, my very first girlfriend, Tina Stevens, she was a year older than me. I was a senior by then, maybe. And anyways, Joel couldn't go on the tour. So, my best friend at the time, Brandon Frenzel, rest in peace, uh, he sang on the tour. And uh, we went down and we were playing a bunch of shows and um, just happened to be like every show pretty much was with Jawbreaker at Sam I Am. Nice. Which was pretty cool. You know, and Unfun had just come out and just this nice straight edge hardcore band playing shows with Jawbreaker and Sam I Am. But it made sense then because that's how shows were. You know, now they're back together and playing giant festivals. I know. They're gonna... It's so crazy. Um, but anyways... Um, yeah, it just so happened that tour ended up like that, but we drove in two cars. I had a truck at the time, and Leah, or, whoops, sorry, Tina. Uh, <laughs> you want to recite yeah. it so you don't get in trouble? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> Leah's my wife. Leave, right now. Leave Tina was my girl, first girlfriend in, you know, yeah. 1990. Um, so uh, we drove two cars, filled the guys up, and my truck had the gear in it, and we just did it. It was super fun. Did our thing. Funny story, we were playing at... Spanky's Cafe, which was a legendary club down in Southern California in the early 90s. And during the set, Sam I Am guys were like making fun of us. Oh, right? probably. So, yeah. I mean, granted, it was kind of that vibe way back then. Like the punk dudes made fun of the straight edge kids. But the straight edge kids can fight. So <laughs> we off stage and Murph and I were like... We're going to fucking kill you guys. Oh, Jesus. Like, I think Murph grabbed a hammer or something, and we're like, keep making fun of us. We don't care. We're going to fucking hit you with hammers. And uh, oh, they shit. stopped making fun of us. And, uh, yeah, that was it. Anyway, so we we get I, home, and it was fine. I have a, a long history of loving that band and disliking their whole fuck straight edge yeah, vibe. Yeah, but whatever. I've never liked that band from that moment. So. Yeah, well, you have personal reason. Yeah, yeah. But that didn't... I'm, 
thank God I, that we'll did love not Jawbreaker happen with Jawbreaker forever. Because I mean, when we meet up with them in in the summer tour in '93 yep. in middle uh, of uh, South Dakota, yeah, Sioux City. No, uh, Dan did the show. Yes, I still talk. I talked to that guy, Rapid well. City, South Dakota. Yep. And I mean, uh, you know, Jawbreaker shows up and they're like, "You guys, you Undertow, guys, what's hey, up?" Like we've <laughs> at various times we've played together, yeah. a bit in your town, a bit. You know, it yeah. was very cool. Yeah. If it had been Sam Liam, it would have been a whole different show. Oh, yeah. I think we would just, uh, yeah. <laughs> we know what would have happened. Anyways, so uh, we get back home, and um, I'm given the ultimatum by the girlfriend. Because we'd been together like three years, mm-hmm. and she was my first girlfriend, first everything. And she had this whole idea that like, oh, you'll do this fun little band thing for a minute, and it'll be cool. And then you're going to go to college, and you're we're going to get married, and then we live our other lives. So and... she thought you were going to stop doing the band. Oh, for sure. So she gave me the ultimatum, her, her undertow, and I picked undertow. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> and uh, hey, and then it is and then it basically is. that provided lyrical inspiration for the whole thing. At both ends, <laughs> boom. So, anyways, uh, yeah. So that it took off then, and then um, by then Seth Lindstrom moves up to. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so we have a second guitar player, and Joel is starting Said Child. Okay, with Seth also. Right. And so we're kind of in limbo what we're going to do. We don't have a bass player. And I happen to go see Green Day at the OK Hotel. And they're about to go on. And there's this young kid in front of me. And keeps turning around looking at me. <laughs> and he's all, hey, you're John. You're an undertow. I'm all, yeah. What's your name? And he goes, my name's Damien. And um, he's all, I love your band. I'm all, oh, thanks, man. Um, nice to meet you. You play in a band or anything? And he's like, oh, maybe, I don't know. I play bass. And I'm like, we need a bass player. Well, you know what? I'm actually, I left out James. Yeah, Spanky. That's, that's true. Spanky was in the band. So that Set. must have happened a little bit later, right? Yeah. Spanky so was in the Spanky band. Spanky was in a band called Facers. So, so you. Kirby, who is in Himsa with me. Absolutely. And. Um, and Soto. And Soto, yeah. And Eric Kinder. So they had Face First. Yeah, we're kind of jumping around. I just can't put everything in. Well, that's fine. And by the way, that's such a, an amazing group of people to be in a band yeah. together. So, okay. When Joel first left the band, you moved to vocals and mm-hmm. Spanky was in the band. And that actually, yep. the thing that was cool about that was that, no offense to Joel, but for what you guys were doing, you were a better vocalist. Thanks. We're, and I don't know that that would have been the case when you started playing bass, but the band that you evolved into, you raised the bar on the vocals. Thank you. It's the truth. I I loved and, and Joel I like as a what, front man. I like what Joel okay. does now. Yeah, like I think Joel's got a cool thing, and yeah. he was definitely just it wasn't gonna be a long term thing no, with Joel no, singing for in, sure in Undertow. Spanky James James we called him Spanky. Yeah, he filled your shoes on bass, but he could play right. But he actually had he, could, he and he, he could jump and he move. brought that that same he thing brought that you brought with but with a little more musicianship yeah. so you guys just increased yeah, it was again it was... and then Seth came in and he moved in from San Diego and had that vibe too so when when we were that five piece like it things really really started going it's it, it those seemed, were it seemed good quick. shows yeah they were really really fun good shows and you guys were also fun yeah and he definitely brought a lot of humor to it too mm-hmm. like there was you know yeah it, you yeah. were serious yeah. but also there was going to be a lot of like it was just going to be a good time. Yeah. Yeah. So then Joel's doing said child with Seth and that's becoming more important for Seth and Mark and Ryan. I'll see that. And this is the thing. Those guys all went to high school together and whatnot. So they're around each other all the time. I am a little older than them. I'm already out of high school, but I also, you know, I'm from Snoqualmie Valley, so I'm 45 minutes away anyways. So I don't know the the turmoil and what went down with everything. Yes, I'm just, I think, Mark's just like, the guys I'm are out of the band. Pretty this sure is what we're between, doing. I'm like, cool. I'm pretty sure between Mark's and Ryan's podcast, you mm-hmm. can piece together yeah. a fairly accurate from their perspective exactly. version of what happened there. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So jump ahead. Um, yeah. James leaves the band too. And so we're left without a bass player. And so we're kind of just like, what are we going to do? And I'm at Green Day. I meet Damien. And actually, Green Day is about to play. OK Hotel is this legendary venue down by the waterfront. And it was always hot as hell in there. And Damien passes out. <laughs> oh, he passed out. <laughs> he passed out in front of me. And I picked him up. <laughs> and uh, and that's kind of where he was just like, oh, hey, you, you know, you're an undertow. And it's like, yeah, I was, I think. I don't know what's going on. And he's like, oh, what? Like, yeah, we need a bass player. And he's like, well, I play bass. <laughs> <laughs> and that Just was like it. that. Yeah. 
and happened fast. Happened fast. And um, was yeah. his first show at the Nappy Dugout in Vancouver? Yeah. Okay. Wow. But uh, he's been on the. Did he br- oh yeah, he probably yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. We got photos from that show. Yeah. We used a photo from that show. Yeah. Uh, on for the uh, stalemate seven inch. That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know who else played that, but it doesn't matter. So you very quickly went from Undertow's broken up. Oh shit. To Undertow's back together With and they're gonna do a bunch of stuff. And right about base, that time, and he can play. And he and can he play. Can write. So I was up in Bellingham, and I was putting together the "This Is My World" cassette compilation oh, yeah. that was going to be with issue five of my zine, mm-hmm. which has a Sam Am interview in it. Okay, Ooh. <laughs> and Jawbreaker on the cover. So see, you can't get away from these Weird. bands. <laughs> so um, you guys had that five song demo, mm-hmm. and so we were putting we put a song we put Stalemate off of that on the cassette comp. Yeah. I believe it was mm-hmm. that. And then in the course of doing that. You know, I think Ron had connected me to, and I don't know if I was talking to you, if I was talking to Mark. I can't remember who I was talking to. But they're like, why don't you do the seven inch version of this demo? This demo. Yeah. And I think it may have even been, if we do an LP, why don't you put it out? Something. I can't yeah. remember if I was asked or if I made the offer, but very, very quickly, I was going to start doing stuff with Undertow. And mm-hmm. the fact that that was offered, I'm like, I have to move to Seattle. Mm-hmm. Like, and then right. Oh, that was the whole. Well, reason that was happening, I was Dutch East India uh-huh. had offered me money. They said, "Oh yeah, we will pay to press things that you want to have made." Right? This ended up being a fucking fiasco later, but <laughs> um, it, not between me and Dutch East, just between the stupid politics of yeah. that in the scene. Community. But <laughs> it shouldn't you shouldn't make records with someone else's money or something? But uh, I had this chance to do this stuff. And then Ron was like, "Well, hell, dude! Like, if you're gonna come to Seattle, I can get you a job and a place to live." And it was like. Kinko's. I'm there. I'm Move. gone. I'm getting a job at Kinko's. I'm moving in. Oh, I'm not moving with Ron. I'm moving in with Derek Harn. And then I'm not <laughs> moving with Derek Harn. I'm moving in with Jen Schneeweiss. But whatever. I yeah. got there. But it was a real catalyst that was going to be doing more records. And at the time, I was going to do something with Resolution, too. Like, oh, okay. like yeah. putting out, there was going to be some kind of a split. There was all, there was, there's an ad that has all these records that are going to be coming out between Overkill, Bill's label, and my label. And it's like, I think half of them actually yeah. happened. Yeah. But. We had a lot of plans at yeah, the time. There's a lot going on. Dude, that resolution 92 was to 93. So good. Yeah, it was that really 10 inch is killer. Oh, it is. Not everyone agrees. I, I do. I do. I love it. How crazy did that that lineup of people. Yeah. You know? you well, got... Vic still. I still see Vic playing in bands. Yeah, he Vic played drums. Plays, Brotherhood and I see him on Facebook all the time. Dan went on to play in Sunny Day Real Estate. A little, a little band. A little band called Sunny Day Real Estate. Crazy. And yeah. Who, and then, and well, who's the bass player? It was Brian Kraft. Crafty. Yeah. Yeah. He's out doing stuff. Yeah. So. He's crazy. Yeah. So you moved down. Mm-hmm. Put out the Which isn't about Undertow, but I'm just saying, like, that's the time frame where what you guys were doing impacted me and pulled me into Seattle. Yeah. And it, that's where I've been ever since. And that's Killer. why I've had all these experiences and yeah. did the label and did all that stuff. Amazing. So then I got to just see, you know, I was seeing, uh, then it just I was start- seeing Mark and Ryan, like, every day, it felt yeah. like, for a while when I first moved down. Yeah. And then you guys were going. Whew. And then you said, hey, we're going to go on tour. Go on tour with Spark Marker. With Spark Marker. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't remember uh, when that was. I know we did another West Coast tour, but that might have been. I know Joel went on a tour with us on the West Coast, but I only remember that because we played Gilman Street with Final Conflict and MDC. And it was <laughs> a total gnarly punk show where these crew cut straight edge kids fucking white bread you know <laughs> xed up in gilman and we get on stage and there's just shit being thrown at us did you come on that trip with us not that one. not that one so yeah just fucking but you're saying thrown. joel was in the band when that happened yeah joel i think joel okay. was singing then sorry we're jumping back but that, we are there's we're, just some fun stories i like to bring beginning. up just to kind of like as we're talking, these things trigger off, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, there was this one show, and the cool thing about that is the singer of MDC, he and, um, oh, this is a bummer why I'm forgetting his name, from Final Conflict, Ron, there it is, they come up on stage and save our asses. They're like, hey, these kids are on tour, doesn't matter about their politics or what they are, they're here, they're one of us, you know, and there's no reason to be fucking assholes to them embrace them what did they think and, your politics were well just because edge? we were straight edge you know <laughs> like and i think their idea of that was just like maybe like you know the vibe of like youth of today and yeah. they thought maybe judge militant and whatnot that just all that bullshit and um you know gilman street had that punk as fuck vibe to it and uh 
they came on stage, said that, and the crowd turned, and they loved it. And we go into a song, and the place erupts. It was so fucking cool. Wow, that's yeah, cool. It was nuts. It was nuts. Anyways, so yeah, we uh, Damien gets in the band, and we take off. Spark markers going on in Vancouver, and they're buddies, and they come down and play with us a lot, and um, they invite us on a U.S. tour. That's ninety three. It was 93. 93. And originally, Ron and I, we've covered this in other episodes, yeah. but we were going to film the whole thing. Yeah. And do like another state of mind version of you guys. It's so cool. <laughs> it would have been cool. But then Ron didn't go. Yeah. Whoops. Um, and so, yeah, yeah you jump in the van with us and we take off and have. The I've never been best anywhere times. else in the country. Yeah. I've gone to of, California. Yeah. To us too. This is all just, and, and this is, you know, Mark calling. You know, having the MMR book your own life and getting connections from other bands mm-hmm. and Spark Market had already done a US tour. So we had, you know, they were hooking up a lot of shows, but some of the stuff Mark was using doing. dialers to get dialers, free phone, phone calls and pay phones and giant phone bills to just try and get to the next No city. internet, no cell phones. Nothing. Yeah. It was awesome. It was good. And so much fun. So we left. We take off. Uh, <laughs> the Before we even get out of Washington. We yeah. get pulled over, yeah. and this was our. This was like, oh, are we gonna are we gonna run into a lot of cops on this tour? Is that gonna happen? <laughs> yeah, because I don't think we were even doing anything. <laughs> Any idea? Well, we were pulled over because the tail lights were out. Tail lights. And the was dude... this the cop that made me pay him two hundred fifty bucks to go away? No, that was Wyoming. That Although was I Wyoming. don't think I, I think yeah. that number is higher now. I think that it was sixty bucks. But believe I'm me, that was a, it was a in today's dollars. Today's dollars, yes, <laughs> yes. No, he he hit three out of five bands that came across oh, Wyoming. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, I told this story to someone at a party recently. It was someone's father who was there. It was like a baby shower thing. Yeah. And they were asking about something, and I kind of related the story of the '93 tour in terms of police encounters. And it was. <laughs> it's a it's a little bit haggard, man. So gnarly. So he pulled us over, yeah. and I think we thought. This tour is going to go great because cops love us because he comes up and says, hey, I pulled you over. What are you guys doing? He's trying to figure it out. It's kind of a younger guy. Yeah. And then Mark or somebody or Damien, someone's like, oh, we're a band from Seattle. And his eyes lit up. And he was like, really? That's cool. Yeah. He was just like, I think he was just, he just wished he was going on a tour. So he like helped us fix the lights. Yeah, that's right. No ticket or anything. Mm-hmm. Just like, I just want to make sure you guys are safe on the yeah. road. Have a good time. This is so great. You can have so much fun. And we're like, cops are great. Yep. This tour is great. <laughs> and that was that. Yep. <laughs> Turn the page. <laughs> we didn't run into quite as friendly of law enforcement. It the got rest, worse. The rest of the, the time. farther east we went. <laughs> but I mean, that's, it was just, yeah. Yeah. Like, we thought, I mean, it, it, when he first walked up, like any cop, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, God, it's not like. Any of us, I think, had had that grade of police encounters prior. Yeah. You know, most of mine had not been good up to that point. So I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, this is man, things are really going oh, our way. Yeah. And then we drove the rest of the way to Nampa, Idaho. Nampa. <sighs> Near as I can tell, the only industry in Nampa, Idaho, was porta potties. Really. I think we actually, I think the place where you guys played that show, I've said this before on this podcast, was between two rival porta potty distribution <laughs> or manufacturing distribution <laughs> companies. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> so Black. I think that's that. That was how this thing started. Yeah, and it was it was all right. No, what do you yeah. remember? What do you remember? Um, I don't remember much until well, Dan Dittmer, South Dakota. That's a ways in. Yeah, and that band straight straight from the heart because I had the demo. Yeah, but they didn't actually play that show. Did they? No, but they were from there, and they were at the show, and that was kind of like one of those moments. I mean, back then, like. You got a lot of records and demos, but a lot of bands didn't come our way into the Northwest. So, you know, when the verbal assaults and amenities came, you were psyched because it's like, well, I have this band's record and I'm talking to these guys. And there's a little, you know, fanboy inside that's kind of like, yeah, this this dude's just like me, but he's so far away from home. Now that we're a band and out of the state and yet we're, you know, I'm meeting people who records I have or zines I have. And it's a just a like a an incredible feeling of just there's so many people out there like-minded you know you know it's out there but to just go into some like place south dakota of all places not in my furthest mind would i ever think i would do that when going back and forth from california and stuff was kind of like it was incredible and awesome and super fun and that's what basically launched the rest of the stuff that we did but 
it was just a different vibe when you started headed to east because you never thought we'd ever do that right you know and so the so further we, we got went... and you're meeting it meeting these people of like that i this have so much respect you know that you wouldn't think would you'd ever cross paths it just like it made it even more fun and more comfortable you know it's like for me i'm i'm leaving home i'm you know i come from a really good family and to leave my folks and you know my sister it's like a it's like a huge thing and to be gone for seven weeks that's like just you can't even explain it it's uh you know lost and it's blurry and i hope i'm okay you know i want to make it home you know uh and you know getting to that area and then you get the 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 wyoming thing and some asshole cop and then you're you're like there's just so much emotion well he 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 made you come back to the car yeah and you said there was a sawed-off shotgun in the front seat. Yeah, dude, fucking just threatening me and just like, th- th- and those are the, like, and so that's the negatives of just like, fuck, what am I doing? You know, it's like, you, you know, wh- what's the point of this? But you'd yeah. already been blown up at that point. Oh, yes, yeah, shit, yeah. Sorry, so, go back to Boise. <laughs> no, I, no, 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 not wait. Boise. Pueblo, Colorado. Oh, it's just all fucking all together. <laughs> like, so we, fuck. we're kind of on the, we haven't gotten that far. We're going up and down. We, yeah. we go to... uh we go to um, there were, above. No, Pueblo is like in the southern part of the. State, oh, Boulder. Right? Yeah, we went to Boulder, Colorado, uh-huh. and then we went down. And that whole trip to Pueblo and back was insane because that's the burning train. That's the oh, shit. these I things have been covered. In, these things these have been covered in other episodes of this. But podcast. I've listened to them and I'm and, and like I'm like oh shit I remember that. yeah there was a yeah, it was yeah. right before the Fourth of July yep. and there was a train on fire yeah. that was full of fireworks. Yep. Just alongside the freeways, we're driving, and Insane. it's um, and Kim was freaking out from Spark Market. He was pulling. He pulled over and was like, "Gonna call somebody, like, to report that there was a burning <laughs> train," you know. Um, but so we we play that show in a basement. You play the show in a basement in Pueblo, Colorado, and afterwards, everyone's hanging out at the van. Yeah, and you got yeah. blown up, skinheads, Nazi skinheads. Yeah, a truck drives by. Yeah, someone throws, throws a, a homemade, homemade firecracker. Bomb. Yeah, it seemed like a bomb. Yeah, it was. Tell that <laughs> from your point of view. That's what I've been told I, a couple times on here. Yeah, but and you I, and I might really have even talked about it. Maybe a little bit in that one. But, but we didn't go into the tour. No. In that episode. We so. didn't even get to it. Right. Um, I just You're remember being outside. Somebody. Yeah. Being outside the van and just something blew up in my face. So we're parked on the, we're parked on the, the left side of the road. Or on the right side of the road. We're parked properly on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. So you are out on the driver's side of the van talking to someone. Yeah. We, all the rest of us are in the van. Mm-hmm. And a truck drives by really slow. And then... I think I was getting directions. You might have been. Yeah. And then there's a huge explosion. It rocks the van. Yeah. The truck takes off and all these kids come running from the house where the show had happened with like cinder blocks. Mm-hmm. Like over the head. They were like trying to throw at the truck. Okay. And then... Because I'm on the ground. Right. And so none I of us... So we're all like, oh my God. And then you come wandering you couldn't see yeah and you came wandering around the back of the van to where the side door was open and Mm -hmm. you were like kind of clutching at your chest because i think you thought you had been shot uh like Mm -hmm. because you know yeah like maybe you thought it was a drive-by or something so we put you on the ground everyone's freaking out put you on the ground poured water over your eyes did all this stuff you remember that uh loosely are you angry that we didn't take you to the hospital no, like fuck. you told us not to. Yeah, because it cost you cost money. <laughs> you know, you I had sixty dollars in my pocket, or two fifty, or something. You were, you, you were literally for the next two months. So you nothing. There was no shrapnel in this thing. Nothing. It was all concussive. Yeah, I don't think there was. I don't think there was any blood. No, you didn't. But, but your eyes yeah. were fucked up. Yeah, as we burning. were driving, so my face we, was burning. We weren't sure what we were gonna do. And uh, so the guy who had put on the show was like, oh, those those Nazi skinheads, they do this all the time. I remember that being said. <laughs> like, what? Wait, they throw bombs <laughs> at people all the time? We might have been warned. Yeah. There might be some Hello. bomb tossing. Yeah. So we weren't sure what to do. And mm. as we were driving, and I think at the time we actually thought we we're going to drive to the hospital. And I think it was on the way there that you said, I am starting to be able to see. I think we should just... Keep Go going. to the next spot and see what happens. Yeah. And then you just recovered. Yeah. Because, yeah, why not? Let's just. <laughs> Wolverine, dude. <laughs> You're a straight edge Wolverine? Yeah. Adamantium. <laughs> well, I, I saw it happen. Heal quick. Yeah. Gnarly, huh? Mm-hmm. And I forgot about that for years. And I, I think people think it's exaggerated. 
but I wish we had been filming it because people would understand that it pro- it's probably being undersold. Yeah. Because it was so surreal. Yeah. That I'm not sure that. I, I, yeah. Yeah. It, it was too much. Yeah. It was too much. I'm, to deal with. I'm sure it was probably like a M80 and it just happened to blow up right at my chest or something, or maybe an M200 or something. Yeah, I've never like been. That. I've never I mean, been. If as, it moved the van, then I've never been, been as close to that big of an explosion okay. since. You would, uh, but the windows didn't shatter or anything no, like no, that, and there was no didn't. shrapnel. You know, no, so. and, the, and listen, it's very possible that the van moving was everyone jumping. Yeah, or me hitting it. Up. Who knows? Yeah, so who knows? It, Whatever. Something went off in my face. It sucked. We left. It it sucked. We left. We passed a burning train. <laughs> yeah, and then we go. So then we go all the way up, and yeah. then across Wyoming. Yeah, and it was in Wyoming that you got pulled over. Yeah, and we had to. You came back. I remember you came hey, back boy. cursing. Oh, did he have an accent? Maybe. <laughs> and you had to pull money out of the little uh, Rasta bag yep. that had the money the in it. Rasta bag. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Murph sent me. No, there's a picture of that Rasta bag Still. on Murph's episode podcast page. Killer. Yeah, he has it. He Still. Still, yeah, that's amazing. That had the that had the, the trip money in it. <laughs> yeah, pay the cop. The yeah, exactly. Keep so you going. went. You or went. I was going to jail. The, yeah, for nothing. For nothing. For not yeah. speeding. Yeah. Um, and then we found out that other bands got stopped. The same cop yeah. and same thing, taking money. And then I've over the years I've heard people talking about cops doing that when you're an out of state. There's yeah. nothing you can do. No. And they basically you. It's weird that you pay money and don't get a ticket. You don't get any kind of paper. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Weird. Well, since you're from out of state, you won't come back for the court date, so we have to put you in jail. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. Heard that many times. Yeah, it's real hard to be white and get pulled over by the cops at America. Yeah. So it just just for perspective, you know, I think there's probably a lot of people that would love to have gotten away with a $60 fine on the spot. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I I understand that. Yeah, unfortunate. Yeah. So. But this is what our experience was. Yeah. It still felt like it sucked. Yeah. Yeah. So after South Dakota, now we're now we're into the areas that yeah. we go to getting uh, deep. Get, yeah, get into the U.S. and you're meeting some people. Yeah, and we went to Canada. T- Did we? Tell me. Oh yeah, man. Hmm. <laughs> You've done a lot of touring. I've done so much touring. <laughs> I can't remember. I all I remember is getting to New York. Okay. Because we meet Freedom. Oh yeah. And he starts taking us around, and like. I remember we're like crossing the street. It was like we were crossing the street and it was like hardcore icons like walking by us in New York City. And I mean, one, we're in New York City, which at that time was incredible. Yeah. And Freedom was this guy that one of you were pen pals with and he worked at the record store in New York City. And um, I don't know if he was putting on our show at ABC No Rio or not. I, I can't remember. Know. But he lived anyways, on he was and he knew John Lisa. John Lisa. That's right. And so he was going to be our tour guide and we start walking around New York city and he's showing us Thompson square and you know, CB we're CBGBs at the time. We walk into the think? record store. Simone's working. Simone. That's where we met her. We oh all gosh. met Simone, Simone on the same day. She's yep. behind the counter in yep. the record store. What was yep. that store called? It was a little know. blacklist record style yeah, record store something. in New York city. Hardcore <laughs> so, records. So we met, we met freedom and Simone on the same day. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we're walking across the street and he's all, oh, hey, there's Harley <laughs> from the cro Mags. And we're all like, whoa, no way. We look and he looks at us and just gives us this dirty look and like says something snotty. And we're just all turn our heads scared. Just like, oh, uh, OK. And we get another couple blocks and then we run into like Gavin from Burn. And that was incredible because, you know, I, obviously cro Mags, you know, an influence on Erto, but Burn even more of an influence and a little bit more um of the time and uh he stopped and you know chit chatting with us and like you know oh i know who you guys are and it's kind of oh, like whoa that's awesome that's crazy you know and uh you know and then we mess around new york for a while and then we go to play abc no rio with uh <laughs> you guys ran into underdog dude richie richie working in didn't you maybe Maybe I'm mixing it up. I, mean, I don't think so. Because that, that would have bugged out on We that. broke up into two groups, and yeah. I didn't meet anybody famous. Okay. I don't remember who I was with at that time. Yeah. I don't I remember. If, if we met Richie, I would have bugged out, because I was like, he was like one of my favorite friends. No, men. dude. I went out with John Lisa, and we went out to Long Island to meet the the woman that I did the business with at Dutch East. Oh, okay. So I think that it won a, some of your New York experience, I was having a Long Island experience. I don't so think the whole band we... went there, but I'm not uh, sure. No. I don't remember Long Island. Okay. Did, but did well, we you meet back remember... up at John Hilt's? Or do you get back with us? I was with you for most of it, yeah. Okay. We we did Wait, have a Long Island Long experience. Island, yeah, when we were parked in the parking lot. 
uh, my friend. That's Staten Island. Staten Island, jeez. Where it's we get kicked off. So we what got... happened in Long Island? <laughs> there was a show out there. We tried to go to some beach. Someone got mad. With fa- Did Fallacy play that? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But anyway. that's a Staten Island band. Yeah. I think. <sighs> this podcast is a mess. <laughs> it's uh, it's funny. Yeah. I, I thought it would be a little more together, but we're still getting yeah, there. We're piecing uh, it. What I mainly remember about Long Island is there was a woman who had been training to be a broadcaster. Okay. And she was telling me that she had a, she'd been trying to do a Midwest accent. She was trying to sound like nothing. <laughs> and she said, you almost have the right accent, but you sound a little bit Canadian. I'm like, well, oh. yeah, we live up kind of close yeah. to the Canadian border. She's like, yeah, you do have an accent, but it's way closer. It's a lot easier for you. And she's like, here's my real voice. And then she started talking total Long Island. And I remember it was just so <laughs> rad because she'd been doing this, like almost sounded like she was on the news voice. Uh-huh. And then she just went Long Island uh-huh. on me. I was like, this is fantastic. Oh, this funny. is one of the coolest things on the, you know, so yeah. she was all about accents. Huh. And then some dude got naked. I think it was a dude from 1.6 band. I don't know. There was some kind of oh, weirdness yeah. and I was falling asleep. So I was missing a lot of it. Huh. And then we, so the, yeah, we, the thing you're talking about on Staten Island, which has also been covered on this podcast a yeah. couple times, we came back from Maryland from playing with John Henry West. Oh yeah. That little. That Tony Joyce place. Yeah. And was that. He was uh, mad because we were late. Um. What was that town called? Uh, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. John Henry West. And who were they with, touring with? Was it Policy of Three? Yeah. Yeah. It was, Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was John Henry West, Policy of Three, Undertow, probably a couple other bands. Yeah. Um, I remember that's when I met Scott Bybin. So I ended up in the... Oh, shit. <laughs> I ended up in the van talking to Scott Bybin most of that yeah. night. That was the thing. Yeah. And, uh, whew, yeah. Craziness. Yeah. The saga of him has been up and down and all over the place. Yeah. Jesus. So we drive back and it takes forever. Mm-hmm. And we get to Staten Island. Exhausted. And there's a note from Freedom's mother saying they in. can't stay here again. Yeah. So it's like four in the morning or five yeah. in the morning. He says, sorry guys, like you can't crash on the floor. There's a parking lot a couple blocks <laughs> over. Just go. And it's so hot. It's so hot. Humid. It's July uh, 7th or something. driving in their underwear. Brutal. So we drive over to the parking lot. And we shut the van off, and we'll just lay down where we are, in the seats or whatever, and go to sleep. Until we are awakened by the sound of... A flashlight? It was, Bi- it was Billy Club. Billy on the, Club, on the, yeah. On the roof. Yeah. It could have been a Cops. flashlight. Yeah. They were real interested Mag-light. in what we were doing in that yeah. van. What are you guys doing here? I was trying to sleep. Yeah, you can't do that. You can do that in Seattle now. So we would have been fine. Totally. I mean, we could pitch a tent on the they sidewalk. S- <laughs> It'd be fine. Yeah, anyway. Do you remember they said, they, they said a line. What was it? We explained what was going on, that we were just trying to catch some sleep because we've been driving all night. And they said, this is a little too ritzy of a burrow for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is a ritzy burrow. <laughs> ritzy burrow. So they told us we needed a drive to New Jersey mm. right now. Yeah. So we went for John Hiltz's. Yeah. Where we had already been. Yeah. And so we had kind of already outstayed our welcome, but we went back to John Hiltz's. And he was nice about putting us. Totally, totally cool. Yeah. Class act. Awesome dude. Yeah. And then after that, we descended into the south. Yeah. You don't remember Canada. I don't. We went swimming. We jumped off the high dive. Honestly, I don't remember a lot of that tour, except like going to New York and at John Hilt's and then like getting all the way back over to like Southern California. Okay. Well, I'm going to, you're going to remind you of a couple things. Okay. We got pulled Shoot. over at the border coming back down into to New York from Canada, from Toronto. Did Sparkmarker go with us? or Because Sparkmarker was in New York recording. Yeah. And we like took all, like we were on our own for like a week. I right? think that's what happened. Yeah, we went on like our own. Yeah. So we, we went swimming at the university up in Toronto or whatever. Okay. And then jumped off high dives, did a bunch of stuff. And then on the way back, we were coming through the border at like five in the morning and there was no one else. And the border guard was training somebody. And so he used us for training. Oh. Remember? And they put us on the seats. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they left us there for like a half hour yeah. and they made us stand up and then move to other seats. And then we got to watch them tear the seats apart to yeah. see if we hid anything. Yeah. Now you remember. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. They let us go. Like yeah. they didn't they didn't find anything. There was nothing to find. It just took forever. I think they were shocked. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking bullshit. <sighs> okay. So you didn't remember that. No. You must remember the almost fight in Florida. I don't. John. Really? You were yelling at some guy for hitting a dog. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> we, yeah. weren't, we weren't in the van. We were in a car. Yeah. We were with somebody down there. 
we were in a car. You saw something and you yelled at him. And then we all got in the car. And then even before we moved a foot, you were like, get out, get out of the car. And we all piled out. And there were like two total grown men, like trying to fight us. Yeah. Do you remember how you, uh, how no, you ended that? I do not. How do you not? You're the Dave. hero of this story. Dave. <laughs> I've done too much touring. I've been in too many fights. I don't know when to shut my mouth or I know when to speak up. You know, uh, this, I, this was know. all There's a lot of concussions up here. This was, this was all an argument over. You did like this the way podcast the guy was... is just me, <laughs> me and my like, you know, Alzheimer's kicking in. I'm gonna. And... Fi- I'll find the memories, John. <laughs> I'll find them. We'll find them. We'll get them. So you were mad about the way this guy was disciplining this puppy or whatever was, it was. He was hitting it. Yeah, yeah. None of us saw it but you. Yeah. As far as I know. Yeah. I don't think any of the other guys mm-hmm. did. So I think on this tour, I think you were 23 years old. Probably. You might have been 22 years old. Probably. 20. Yeah. So this guy had gone and got his friend who was like some kind of bodybuilder dude. Mm. And he came back. Mm. When he got his friend, he was like, oh, you guys want to go now? You think you're tough now? You're going to talk shit? And he comes <laughs> up. And there's all this yelling back and forth. And the dude who was mad who went and got his friend, now his friend is like, what did you fucking drag me into? There's a bunch of these punk rockers. These two of them have dreadlocks. What the yeah. fuck? You know? Yeah. And so the guy who was the one who had the dog, you were talking some kind of shit. You had your sunglasses on, right? <laughs> and he looked at his friend. The, the bodybuilder guy, and he goes, I just want to clock this kid right now. And you took off the sunglasses and went, go ahead, man. I'm under 18 years old. I want to go home. I, we will sue your ass. And they just turn and walk away. Like when you said that, yeah. they just went, under 18? You yeah. were not under oh, 18. No, you were no. 40. I just you know. looked it. Right, you were just, and, but the way you, you totally just like, you put your hands at your side with like one hand holding your, your glasses and just put your face out to him and was like, hit what me. What a dick. Oh, it was a move, dude. It was a total move. And it was so rad. And, and they were just like, what the fuck? And they just, that was the end of it. And they were gone. And then we all got in the car and we were all just like, who's always to fight adult men? Okay. This sucked. <laughs> But it was it became awesome right on. shortly after that. I totally don't remember this. You don't remember doing that. No. I, I remember the guy hitting the dog. I remember us confronting him. But I don't remember the song. That's how you shut it down. Yeah. You told him to hit you. Wow. He said, I want to clock this yeah. kid. Yeah. Go for it. And the bodybuilder dude, he wanted to, whatever, the bigger guy that yeah. he went and got, yeah. he wanted it over. Oh, he yeah. was just like, what did you, you could tell in his yeah. head, he probably, as soon as we were gone, he was probably like, don't yeah. ever fucking do that again. Yeah. Well, dude you know? probably couldn't fight either, just because he's a bodybuilder. Yeah. Yeah. He just, dude wasn't going to come after a yeah, car with six, of six us. people, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Six of us, uh, whoever was driving the car. Yeah. I don't think it was VAR. Oh, I think, VAR. Whoa. I think we no were, idea. Yeah. I think wow, we were crazy. in another part of Florida. Was he Pensacola? I don't know. Or Cause Tallahassee? Var- where was no idea from? Because, oh, no idea from Gainesville. Gainesville, yeah. Who knows? I don't think could have yeah, been. I don't know. But I don't remember Florida. <laughs> except far. I don't remember a lot of the South. I, was, <laughs> no, I, I had my I own little. I forget it. I had my own little breakdown. I know there was something in Kentucky. Like, Blue, I had a little this bullshit. A little breakdown like, about blueberries. Fuck. Oh my God, your blueberry pancakes. <laughs> yes. Those and your shorts coming. at John Hilton's. <laughs> the funny thing is, <laughs> that was Mark, Mark put my shorts on the. I put oh, my we shorts drove off. on the. <laughs> Someone did skull it. Skull skate shorts. Yeah. No, Mark Mark talked about that on this podcast. He yeah. felt bad. Um, no, he didn't. <laughs> he, st- he says he does now. Oh. I'm sure he didn't at the time. Turning um, stones. What's that? Turning stones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, no, I just, I, I had it in my head. We, I've covered, we've talked about this, but this yeah. is why it says these aren't blueberries on the at both ends, on the etching yeah. on the at both ends yep. LP. It's because... <laughs> I wanted blueberry pancakes. I was going to splurge and spend money. I want on blue. And I just love blueberry pancakes. This place we had stopped had them, and I was Waffle of, House. Was out of my mind. Was this a Waffle House? Mm-hmm. I think this might have been a different place. You think so? I don't know. But we always went there because it was cheap. But I was just bummed, man. I was yeah. just my brain was just frying. We were all so sick of it. So sick of the South. Yeah. It was all just bugs and hot and horrible. Yeah. And they put these things in front of me, and I took a bite right out of the middle. And it just tasted like they had made like this pancake with like raisins. Like there was no, <laughs> there was no juice. There was no tart. No, nope, there was no, no nothing. Pop. And I just went, <sighs> and I threw my fork Blurs. down. And Ryan or Mark or somebody said, "What?" And I went, "These aren't blueberries." And listen, <laughs> even then, I was aware that 
sure, they were blueberries. Mm-hmm. They just weren't what I wanted, right? Southern and so blueberries. Ryan goes over and takes a piece of it, takes a bite. He's like, tastes like blueberries to me. <laughs> And at this point, my memory disappears. Yeah. So I don't actually know how Shot. freaked out I got at that yeah. point. But I was yeah. I was so unhappy. I think I was probably on the verge we, of like a mental breakdown. Yeah. We just wanted some decent sleep and not be hot. But I think that somehow yeah. we did Texas after that. Yeah. And it got worse. We did that West Texas drive that goes on forever. Forever. Days. And just knowing that California was on the other end I've of it. I've driven that thing. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Hate it. But um, I just couldn't believe people could live in that humidity. Oh, of the South or South, anywhere on the East York Coast, City, yeah. all those. I was just so intense. You know, I was so miserable. So we hit the humidity, but in, shows were awesome in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. In Madison, Wisconsin, yeah. was where we first experienced yeah. it, and we yeah, were just yeah. like, "What? What's wrong?" Yeah, yeah. Oh, in Wisconsin, we met the guys who would turn to be the Promise Ring, Jason the drummer, and one of the other guys. We stayed with them. I can't remember the show, but yeah, that's because I said Madison, and uh, I think I'm saying the wrong place. I, I don't think that's Lacrosse, the... Lacrosse, Wisconsin, Boom. Lacrosse. It's coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Because you're right. The yeah. the thing with staying in Madison, that's when Damien and I went on our walk, and he was getting free sodas at every machine that <sighs> yeah. he touched. It was just insane. He became yeah. magic for a yeah, day exactly. and getting free pizzas and shit. He was in. <laughs> he became a magic elf. Um, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, I was I, at that point. I was suffering from a head injury from Mark. Oh yeah. So I. So listen, while Damien says he remembers getting all these free things mm-hmm. and all these things happening yeah. on this walk I took with him, yeah. I should have gone to the hospital from my bleeding yeah. head wound, and I slept Confession. for God knows how many hours, which you're not supposed nope. to do. So if someone said, you know. We've just we've just gone ahead and let you have that story about the walk with Damien, but it, it never happened. I would believe it. Right. Except that Damien has said it was real. <laughs> but like if he was like, No, I just didn't wanna I didn't want you to know yeah. how close we came to killing you. Yeah. You just went on a mind journey. So that was a different yeah, thing. But um launched. once again, that's you can hear all about that in the Mark, Mark. Holcomb podcast. Yeah. And probably in the Damien one. Yeah. But no, yes, Lacrosse, Wisconsin was where we stepped out of the van and just went, What is this? Yeah. Why is it wet in the air? <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm in a shower constantly. Yep. Mm. And we played a show to like twelve people. You played a show to like twelve people. Yeah. yeah. Up we I had it with Splinter. Oh, was it? Yeah. I know we played with Splinter around there. They were awesome. Totally oh. sound like a Clevo band. When we got to It might have been from Cleveland. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. remember. I remember Splinter. Yeah. When we got to Rapid City, South Dakota. And we played that one show with Jawbreaker. Mm-hmm. A kid comes up to the merch table. He's a young kid. Mm-hmm. And you asked him what his favorite band was. I did. Yeah, the kid was like 12 years old. He was like the Cody Votolato of uh, Rapid City, South oh, Dakota. cool. <laughs> so who knows what band he yeah. ended up starting. You're, you're just later. telling the story that I can't remember. Yeah. Right, but he says, you're interested because he's the youngest yeah. person there, yeah. right? And you're talking to him. And you said, what's your favorite band? And I think you had a preconceived notion of what he would say. Uh-huh. And he went, Descent. Oh, that's right. Remember that? And yeah. you lost your mind. Yeah. You're like, fucking give this kid a t-shirt. I think you yeah. were like giving him shit. Like, free stuff. That's cause right. Because he, he said. Descent was so good. Descent. You're like, yeah. From what? From the what are you pointing at comp? Mm-hmm. From the. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that. There, what was that record called? I don't remember. No, I had an LP, right? Yeah. I put it on an LP. Yeah. That band was good too. But were they yeah. from that area? Somewhere around there. Like the Dan Dittmer guy knew them or was friends with them or maybe put out the record. I don't remember. Okay. Long time ago. All right. Anyway, so. So then we go, we get to California. <laughs> Things get normal. Yeah. I, I know there were shows in Texas, but fuck, I don't remember them. Yeah, I don't either. Couldn't tell you. Do, so all. is there anything you can remember from that tour that we haven't covered? Because we've talked, we've no, hit all I'm the sorry. hits. I thought maybe there would be something that you would bring up. I thought up someone triggered. I know guys, the other guys have talked about them. So, yeah. Yeah. I just yeah, we'll get to California. The only thing I remember is the Murph getting all the attention. He's got a lot of attention. <laughs> he got a lot of it. I hey, learned he's a, a smooth criminal. I learned a lesson on that tour. What's that? Chicks are the drummers. Yeah. And then I, once I started paying attention to that, I was like, oh, shit, all you drummers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe I should play drums. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't. I don't know how to play drums. Me neither. I've tried something so about many it. times. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. It's yep. like, but it's, there's something there. The hand thing and then the foot thing. Can't do it. No, no, God. No. Jesus. Um, yeah, so we get to California. 
And we come and, home. Uh, we come home, and when we come home, there's a scene. There's a scene in the Northwest. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of new kids. But that was building before you It was left. building, but... Because those shows the old firehouse were huge. Yes. But at that time, it was like, the shows were huge, but maybe I just wasn't paying super close attention of, like, hardcore kids or straight edge kids or, you know, in that realm of things or how we all dressed alike or, you know, that type of vibe. Because we come home from that tour and, you know, there's like, there's our bit, like, it has grown. People have moved from other states here. Derek's here. Tim's here. All the tra- Greg's here. Trial guys are here. There's momentum going. People are doing their little, you know, starting to do their things and whatnot. But we come home from that tour and there's like 300 kids. <laughs> and it's just like, what? And then we're meeting the Tacoma guys, you know, the guys that yeah. became botch, you know, and mm-hmm. this, that, and the other. And it was just like, you know, dudes from up in Bellingham, the Death Cab for Cutie guys are coming to shows. Like, it's fucking... And it's just not like Seattle area. There's you know, kids funny driving to you come bring to that Redmond up, shows. I think people wouldn't believe that, but I, I was in Sonic Boom Records one time with one of the dudes from Death Cab. I think it was the bass player. Mm-hmm. And we were talking, and I the dude from, from Sonic Boom, God, Jason... Yeah, that's long. Was saying, oh, he does a record label. He puts out like you know punk rock stuff and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and thinking like, dude from Death Cab's not gonna yeah. care, right? No. He's like, oh, what do, who do you put out? I'm like, uh, Undertow. There's a band. He goes like, I love that band. Yeah, I was just like, Crazy. oh shit, you're right. I mean, yeah, he so totally knew Undertow. Well, supposedly, Mark told me that they did Death Cab did a KXP like live performance, and they did Cutting Away. Oh, that's ins- really. I I've never found a like a recording of her or anything, but I think Mark was the one that told me that, which would be insane. I would think, yeah. Fucking insane. KEXP is recent. There'd be a recording of that. We got to find yeah, out. Yeah. I mean, the last 10 years yeah. or something or something. Like, <laughs> how nuts would that be if that was a real thing? I would have expected there to be a real eruption. Or maybe they were playing media. one of their songs and went into like, <clears throat> hey, let's mess with this and we'll go into. All right, well, I'll, I'll try to track that down if that'd it's true. Insane. I, it's, yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be so fucking cool. <laughs> Crazy. I just saw them on like network TV. Like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good for them. So, yeah, we come back from that tour. Things are exploding here, and we're playing shows to a lot of kids. Who are. And, and it's nuts. You're playing shows with 1007 at the Old Firehouse. So fun. Which was great. Getting and it was, and it was still a time when you That's when I was a, dancing for him. That's what I was getting to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we didn't talk about it yeah. in the last episode. Yeah. Uh, you somehow became a dancer for 1007. <laughs> what? This is after. 1007 like, before, were so good. 107 that band was we, great. Uh, oh, yeah, man. like I'm right now. I'm in the middle of even doing... before you were doing stuff with them. The the Seattle Rain record is awesome. The so Pooh was the demo tape that had Seattle Rain on it. Yeah, and then they did an album called Chainsaw Orchestra. Yeah, I have the original artwork up there. Killer. Somewhere. Um, I didn't put that out, uh, but it who put that out? Dan Garrigan. Really? Yeah. Wow. And wow. I am jealous of it. Because I did put out 1007 <clears throat> Records and yeah. Red Rocket Records and yeah. for the stuff for the hit. Mm-hmm. Chainsaw Orchestra is still my favorite. It's good. Like, it's so good. And it's, it's good. no one knows. I've got, you yeah. know, it's just a, a classic. Yeah. There's a little bit of respect out there for what Matt did. Yeah. He really, and, and all the other he guys. You could write a fucking song, man. For sure. And so they, it was, they were just a, I mean, what are you going to just compare him to? You're not going to compare him to Green Day. He was real influenced by like the replacements and yeah, like the, the, Buzzcocks. Like, and, yeah, it was, it was, it was ma- mature Green Day. Hmm. You know, like which would be replacements, Buzzcocks or, you know, uh, Pixies ish. Sure. You know, We're not vibe. too mature. He definitely had some silly stuff. No, but those, I mean, it was fun. It was sappy. It was intelligent, um, creative. His lyrics were awesome and could write a hook, man. He really? could write a really good hook. Most definitely. Yeah. This is Matt Matsuoka. Who Underrated. If, yeah, if you like those types of bands, check out an old band, 1007. 1007. Killer. Now, because then he puts the band together with straight edge dudes, Soto and Eric, and that's when you start right putting. Oh, up the right, records, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, ten oh seven comes in, edge. and it's like, and that was cool. Like you know, our shows would be all different kinds of bands playing. You know, yeah, this was kind of the end of that era yeah. almost. So nuts. So the thing about you dancing for ten oh seven, they they started doing 
somewhere along the way, they added a theatric element to it where they were going to do something. Matt was going to do something crazy every time. Mm. And he, I mean, he'd whip out a cleaver at the end. Like he'd set up a bunch of smoke bombs yeah. and then, then chop all the strings Bomb off his guitar with a cleaver. Yeah. Um, or so good. So it's something where you were dancing, you and who was the other one? Was it Rob Boer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys would be on the side of the stage and you would dance. And uh, you would write shit on your chest. You'd take your shirt off, and then Matt would have whipped cream and Cover. blow up, blow up gorillas. That oh, would be yeah. Thrown. yeah. There was that one show at the old firehouse where they decided it was going to be tortilla night. <laughs> Do you remember? Yes. They just opened all the packages of tortillas, and people were whipping them around whipping like them. like oh. hundreds of kids <laughs> in this room, and, and there's just tortillas raining down everybody. <laughs> so it's like awesome. this is like being at a, uh-huh. a way too exuberant screening of like Rocky Horror Picture <laughs> yeah. Show, where you get hit in the side of the head yeah. with a bag of bread. It's like it's not even time for that yet. <laughs> so awesome. Oh, those shows were so fun. So those were good. I always yeah. liked that you like were not so serious that uh, Fuck being serious. I remember Matt yeah. was dancing on the side of the stage for you guys mm-hmm. one time. It was like it doesn't work with hardcore. Yeah, <laughs> not quite the no, same. No, but <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. Fuck it. So fun. Yeah, Redman Firehouse started taking off. All these bands started taking off. Yeah, it was a good time. Ninety three didn't in the ninety four summer ninety four ninety four. Then the yeah. L- LP comes out. Yep, yeah. and then we. Hook up with Unbroken and mm. go for that summer tour then, which was like, you know, that first one was exciting, rough, draining, um, inspiring. But then with Unbroken, I mean, it's, we are about to leave for tour and we drive out of Murph's driveway and the van breaks down. <laughs> so we're like, all right, what do we do? All right, let's get our cars and we'll start driving and we'll borrow their gear. We'll figure it out. We get to Centralia. Breakdown. <laughs> Call the Tacoma guys to come pick us up. <laughs> and Phyllis. Hey, can you guys come pick us up? And I think we left the car there. It was Murph's car. <laughs> Over there, drove back. Stayed in Tacoma a day or two to figure it out. And then Mark's like, screw it. We're going to jump in my Oldsmobile. And we're going to drive across country and meet Unbroken in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. And that one was... Uh, was that a little straining? It was straining. Tight. Um, there's a person in that, that was in that, on that tour with us that, uh, didn't, Oh, I don't know that we uh, ever talked about that person. Do we need to? No, we, okay. you and I know who we're talking about. Mm-hmm. A few people know out yeah. there know who we're talking about, yeah. but yeah. there's, let's just say I, I'm scrubbing my history. <laughs> there you go. I'm presenting the version yeah. Yeah. that I want presented yeah. and we'll yeah. just not have everyone in it. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> we get to Detroit and it's like the gnarliest area and all that's flooding back to me is like the South. <laughs> right. <laughs> Shit. Doing this again. And, uh, it's like, why can't we just play shows at home? <laughs> <laughs> but Detroit goes off. It's super fun. And we, you know, the unbroken guys were our brothers and it was, we were ready to go. I mean, San Diego is like our second home. So, um, we do that, and uh, the show, like, show after show, just incredible. Tons of kids. We're really now getting in, like, I guess, like, now Seattle's is known to have bands, you know? And there's tons of kids. Unbroken was super popular that at that time, too. Um, it was funny, because when we made up with them, the band, the band players, are all, you know, grease their hair, <laughs> yeah. you know? Morrissey pumps and, uh, you know, looking nice, rolled jeans. Um, Dave the Singer is dreadlocked, <laughs> looking crusty as shit. Undertow <laughs> are all dreadlocked, dirty, crusty as shit. And I got a pompadour. <laughs> pompadour, big puff, like, uh, you know, we're all, exactly. We or, were all up and we just look at each other. <laughs> Dave and I should have just switched. Well, it's it like amazing. you guys, there you go. But that's like, it's two puzzle pieces. Yeah. You guys just fit together. Yeah, fit perfectly. Yeah, that, that little nub, me and Dave. <laughs> Anyways. So, yeah, so we take off on that tour. We get to the East Coast. I feel like and... we could almost do an entire episode just about your hair. Oh, all, all different versions? <laughs> all different versions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'd be awesome. Tony Hawk, uh, <laughs> Danny Boy House of Pain, um, <laughs> Into the Morrissey. Well, I mean, even... Robert Smith, like who cares if I? That, hey, I like, I like playing dress up. What do you yeah, want? What do you, I know. Who cares? I, I get bored quickly. That's fine. Could change it. I'm still the same dude. Um. So yeah. You got those glasses. These glasses really make you look. You like yeah. them? Yeah, they work for you. Yeah, but this time they're real. 
I need them. Even for the first time, these <laughs> first are first time in life. These are there's actual just... lenses in it. I had to go get my eyes checked. I'm getting old. <laughs> my fucking knees all busted up. I'm losing sad. it. I feel great. I feel great. Yeah. You look good. Oh well, We're thanks for it, that lie. We're killing it. <laughs> Anyways, We're, we get to we could be worse. We could be worse. Could be totally worse. Yeah, straight edge. Straight edge. It's all us three. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we get to the East Coast and um, we start jiving with like the mouthpiece guys and playing shows in Syracuse, like, you know, huge show there with like Bloodlet and uh, who else played Snapcase maybe? Fucking. And then, but that's when we were really in that realm of like the hardcore scene outside of you know the west coast kind of thing and people are knowing our songs the records out Mm -hmm. right records out the the lp LP. was out in the summer of 94 yeah so um shit did we have them on that tour or did you have to send them to us i think i had to send them if you had them at all yeah maybe you might have had i don't know there was some you had some kind of fucking encounter in california with those with the barcodes yeah with the and yeah Yeah. someone said that you told them i mean i don't know if we did this someone said you told them that you have to pay me seven dollars per record so you sell them for eight or something and it was like not at all what you said i remember you saying like <laughs> i did not say that but there was a whole thing written up by like yeah. Kent mcclard about yeah where does that money go what yeah. is that money it's like and it wasn't true yeah because the records were dick. the records were free like yeah. i had my records that came from dutch east and then i gave you records to sell like almost all of them yeah. or you know i had some from yeah. motor and then i gave you guys yeah. and so I believe when we, you and I talked about it, you were like, no, I said, I pay seven, eight dollars for records all the time when I like a band. Yeah. And that person yeah. in their head went back and reported to Mr. McClard. They said they had to pay seven dollars for their records. Jesus Christ. So it became a whole thing. Yeah. Heart attack came out. It became ugly. I got Fucking real lame. I got real disillusioned with a part of the scene that I had loved so much. For sure. I mean, the year before that, we were playing uh, the Red Barn where he was doing shows mm-hmm. with Fuel. Which would you know went on to be John Henry West, um, but it was like Fuel Downcast. It was well, like one of my had, favorite shows I've it, ever well, that been had a to part have been of. Like, like ninety two, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. One of my favorite shows we I've ever played was at because Red Barn was legendary, and we're playing with Fuel, Fuel, the Punk Fuel. Oh yeah, incredible yeah. record. Yeah, don't get mistaken. And Downcast, Monuments to excess. that Downcast seven inch, like you know that band was or that show was insane and then like jump ahead a year later two years later and this motherfucker's like it's talking about barcodes and i'm just like dude there's so much more serious bullshit going on in this world than this i'm sorry we're not fucking punked you anymore yeah. don't give a fuck like whatever An inventory control <laughs> set of yeah. lines to digitize yeah. inventory control fucking for stores yeah i remember it got really like the whole thing i mean i didn't <clears throat> want barcodes on the records i just had to argue each one like yeah. you know how we did it and then i can't remember if the lp had the barcode on or if it was just a cd or what the deal was with that but um well you know what let's answer that right now <laughs> needing answers needing answers oh hey look at that that's a ringworm promise tester what oh shit let's just slide that right back in there give me that no come on dude <laughs> never will i how much it's it has a handwritten note to me. From you only the have building. one. Yeah. Oh, there is a barcode on the LP. Oh shit! Oh, there well, is. Well, well. Oh shit! Marked for life. <laughs> Marked for life. Fuck you. <laughs> God. So um. Wait, do you have any copies of the Ringworm? No. Promise. No, I got some of those long ago. No, I used to, but I had one. I don't know what happened to it. Such um, a bummer. Still looking for it. I may have one up on Discogs right now. You have one up. Yeah, which means it's in a different pile of records because of the records. Oh, so oh. We can look. Just remember, and yeah, we'll yeah. look after this. I got this. money in my pocket, there? dog. <laughs> it's all good. It's expensive. I'm expensive. <laughs> Anyways. So, so so here's the thing, though. Summer 94. Like, stores started, like, printing their own barcodes for their own internal inventory. Like, yeah. this became... Sure, it wasn't in the artwork, but... Like, I had a barcode couldn't... for work. It's how I clocked in. Fucking hate. Like, Apparently, fuck. yeah, it's all the mark of the beast, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I know we're... These were just the battle lines that were drawn, but the battle lines were drawn like so many other times to separate different, mostly like-minded people within the scene. We did not have to have a battle between, there didn't have to be a battle between Born Against and Sick of It All. There didn't have to be a battle between Kent McClard and us or my people that thought the way I did. Mm -hmm. 
later on there didn't have to be a battle between other groups of people but it just it just keeps happening oh, right it, yeah that summer is when things start turning yeah. because you know this undertow was one of those bands we were luckily luckily enough to be in the middle of we were friends and in touch and uh bound with like the victory record bands mm -hmm. and new age records and you know the hardcore or the straight edge hardcore uh label of those types of you know bands and whatnot which was awesome i still have friendships today with those guys and on the other hand we could play with heroin mm -hmm. uh angel hair antioch arrow the gravity band yeah. all that stuff and it was still bonded still same vibe we put on their shows when they'd come up to seattle that type of thing we were luckily enough and those but those you take those two scenarios those never mixed when it with any other I mean, of course i'm broken but there wasn't many bands that crossed that line of being able to do that and it being normal yeah you know um that's what I always took away from the band, and that's what I always loved, that we were able to do that type of thing, you know? Which turns around when this whole thing with the barcode starts happening, it starts soiling friendships yeah. for fucking no reason. Yeah, and, and then was there was a, the scene got big enough in the Northwest that kind of after that summer of 94, there was a real, like, there's enough of us now that we can start weeding out people that yeah. we don't like as much. And... <laughs> That's you know we can just have a hardcore scene. We yeah. don't have to. And that, yeah, it's all the you know. It was a like, lot of a lot of drama like, happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, ninety three. It was like we all need to be here to, to make this help make this community run. And then by ninety four, it was just like, oh yeah, we don't need you. Or but we don't. We don't want to be was still pretty, a part of. We're you. still pretty epic here. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. It was killer. But it still, it, it, Band, other bands were taken off, and un, you know, unfortunately for us, we were getting burnt out tired it seemed and like there were some dark elements yeah total so, dark elements yeah. and um for me personally it was uh you know we've been i've been with these guys we've been playing shows for you know five years now or four you know a little more than four years and you know we did a lot a lot more than i ever thought we would do and um it was like you know musically i was like getting into other stuff you know I was, like super getting into AMRAP music and like just changing like my musical tastes and whatnot. And also shows were getting really violent mm -hmm. friends versus friends and all this bullshit. And it, it also, we would play and there'd be 800 kids going crazy at the Redman Y, but friends fighting friends. Yeah. All this bullshit. And it's like, no, this isn't why we do this. This isn't what, it, but this is where it would happen. And we just, you know, there was that show at the Red and Y, and we walked off stage, and we're like, looked at each other, like, yeah, this sucks, we're done. You and know? that was it, huh? That was the Dead Skin Mass Strain mm -hmm. show when the stage collapsed. Oh right, you know, and we just walked off, and we, it was like, I think Damien was kind of like, like I me, mean, he was the youngin, and so he, I don't think he, he was vibing on that, but me, Mark, and Ryan were just kind of like, eh. I don't know who said it first, but we were all thinking it, like this fucking sucked, you know, and so we were just ready to throw in throwing the towel and you know were you still in town when the show at the sailors union of the pacific happened where everyone chased a guy down the street Which back before belltown was, was into another i think i was not so, I, I know i didn't go well there. it was but you so you moved away to new york for a while oh but yeah but i was the last one out of the three of us that went Did like that? mark and murph had already gone because okay. we like we end up thinking about getting back together you know? Well, so the band broke up. The you, band then, breaks up. The band breaks up. Then you go to Europe. Yeah. So by then, there's other places to do shows. Big John's yeah. is going off in Fall City. Yeah. And bands are starting... A lot of bands are starting to come to Seattle to play. Ground Zero is really awesome. Ground Zero is great. Uh, Magic Studios. Yeah. That, dude, that, well, that goes that back show, a little. That goes to end of 92, 90, or beginning of 93. Yeah, but there's that show with like... It's Undertow, Serenity... And Strain. Strain. That show is incredible. It, it so is. So much a, fun. Yeah. It, so that was before that. But anyway. So there were so many stage dives that the crowd collapsed. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And it was the, was it the day Kurt Cobain died? Or. Oh, I don't know. If it was, well, okay, okay. This is. So the Magic <laughs> Studio saying This is fucking awesome. So, you know, like, yeah, Seattle by then is on the map with the fucking grunge bullshit and all this stuff. But, you know, none of us are a part of that. We've watched all those bands 
from infantile bands growing and seeing them play. By then, we didn't give a shit. Yeah. We had our scene going. We were psyched. And so, Kurt, yeah, Kurt had just died or something. Because there was, a, it was weird. Because there was that other, that generation below us that were like Nirvana kids. But they, you know, discovered hardcore and were going to hardcore shows. And yeah. so they were a part of our community. But there was still this like weird vibe with them being younger and being in with that influence so it was a, a strange cloud over the show so you know the show's going off strain played place goes ape shit and all this stuff we're setting up getting up stage mark's all you're not gonna say it are you i'm like no nah, i'm not gonna say it. i'm gonna say something else and he's like, i know what you're gonna say so we go on stage and there's this like lull and people are waiting for us to start the set and i'm just like i want to take this opportunity just to like you know mention the death of and this kind of like you could feel this heaviness of like uh-huh. this set goes out to John Candy because he had passed away. Oh god, <laughs> that didn't go over very well for some people. Oh. It was just like the record scratch it and we boom, we go into the set. <laughs> it was fucking awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. Anyway, so we break up, but then um, ignite comes up. And plays Big John's. And they're going to Europe. They want to take us with them. They didn't know that we had split. They didn't how much play Ground time... Zero? Big John's? Oh, was it Ground Zero? Uh, I thought I saw Ignite at Ground Zero. Maybe it was Ground Zero. It was Ign- I don't know. Ignite and Earth Crisis. Yeah. It was that show, right? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. Then that's or the was one. it Earth Crisis and Integrity? I can't remember. I don't remember either. There was one show that there were so many... Ground Zero shows were awesome. So there was a show, and I got hurt very badly at it. Really? And I, Yeah, I remember crawling out. No one knew I was hurt. I my head had gotten smashed, and I went and laid my head in that water fountain yeah. that they had it, and I was just yeah. pushing the water and letting it run on my oh, head. No. And, then, and then I went and sat, and no one knew I was hurt, and that was fine because no one saw it happen, yeah. right? But it was another show where just people were getting hurt one after another, and Kornitsky was there, oh. and he came running through the crowd with a first aid kit uh, <laughs> over his. It was like a shark, yeah. Head, cut through, and he runs it, and and then that side room. He had set up like a little triage thing, and there yeah, were all these injured people. Me. And Kornitsky was right. like, oh, "That was oh, awesome. funny." But I, you know, I feel like that was Earth Crisis. It probably was. I'm <laughs> sure, because Ignite played, and it was just you know, it was cool. I think when Earth Cri- Earth Crisis played here in Integrity, like people went fucking ape shit. Yeah. Like we were killing each other. Um, but you know what? We are missing a big important part. We're missing a chunk. Yeah, where we start doing shows with seaweed. And Clint oh, but you starts were, recording us. No, you were playing, because he recorded the LP. Yeah. The Seaweed shows, the, yeah. the really big one that was mm-hmm. Undertow, Seaweed, and Drown, mm-hmm. which was the first time you guys played a show where it was so big, we all went, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. you know, that was that was um, before the 93 tour. Was I was it? I was working at, oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the Kinko's in the U District. Yeah. Flyers got made for that show yeah, there. That that's night. right. Crazy. So that's early, yeah. Yeah. But- Clint was connected, like yeah, he, you know that was just so so awesome. See, he was one of my favorite bands of all yeah, time. Those were good it shows. Was just, oh man, it was so crazy. There were at least two bigger undertow and seaweed shows. The one with Spark Marker at um, St. Joseph Cathedral, downtown Seattle. Oh okay, yeah, that was huge. That was one, but also the Drown Us and crazy because Drown would, became Moss Mouse. That's a weird thing. Is that right? Yeah, Jeremy and um, Jeremy the drummer. He I started... knew that he was in that band, yeah, but I didn't know that other people in Drown became Modest Mouse. Wasn't the Isaac kid in Drown for a oh, while? I don't know. I don't know. I think so. I don't know. It had a real water theme yeah. on, well, the, Jeff, on the flyer. I Jeff, um, what's his last name? That was in Drown. I still see him to this day. He's like a goth dude and comes to yeah. shows at the venue. McCall. Um, Jeff McCall, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Awesome dude. And he was doing shows at his house. Uh, But that's... Yeah, so we go... We go to Europe with Ignite, mm-hmm. and um, it's f- fucking awesome, but miserable at the same time, because Ignite were a bunch you, of dickheads. You mean like tour? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ignite were a bunch of tour. dickheads? But the band with us, too, was Temperance from mm. uh, the East Coast, um, Providence area, and um, I'm still friends with one of them to this day. And uh, it's on that tour, we realized, like, yeah, we don't want to. We we're, we're gonna come home and not do this. Like, but it was you just had one already those... basically broken up prior to leaving, though. Yeah, I think. But there was talk about like, well, let, let's see what happens. You know, let's go. Oh, we're going to Europe. Like, who, like what bands go to Europe? Not many. You know, <laughs> not at, as... at that time. You know, um. So it was kind of like, 
you know that and it was nothing of um uh, us four it, we when we went we were a fucking gang i mean we were hanging tough you know a couple weeks in we were like these fucking night dudes suck <laughs> they're fucking assholes they're just like that's fine the shit the they're podcast, doing huh? they're just like doing rock star shit mm-hmm. like just yeah just scumbaggy shit not all of them but you know them and we just weren't getting along with the dudes and we were like they so the whole idea for us to go to europe was we were basically had to be their roadies so we'd have to set up the gear and you know so you know in europe you are on buses nightliners but they're not like how you tour in the states they're not fancy not fun it's a fucking coffin of fucking 15 bunks and a small toilet and a small like kitchen area yeah that's it. It's just basically because the drives are long and whatnot, and then that's just how things are. So bands all share them all together to keep you know cost down and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So on this, you know, it's our first time going over there, first time for us going there. But you know, we're getting treated like shit from these guys, and especially some of them are like dudes and bands that we were like listened to years before, and yeah. you know, it's kind of like oh fuck you, like. You know, the smoke and mirrors of just like, oh, like, I thought you'd be fucking awesome, but you're a fucking shithead. Like, you're scum. And you're you're exactly what I fucking can't stand about this world, you know? So that's shit, and that's going on, and but we're, we're just tight, and we're like, you know, we're going to get through this. And fucking by the time the tour's almost over, we're basically like, fuck off to these guys. Like, they're on stage, we're throwing shit at them. The last show, like... Even the tour manager that was with us was a fucking dick to us. Just, you know, fucking treated us like fucking scumbags. Or not, they were scumbags, but treating us like fucking assholes. Right. And uh, I just, one night, this guy, he's fucking yelling at me. I'm like, fuck you, you're not my dad. Don't fucking talk to me that way. And it was probably for something fucking stupid. So what did I do? I filled up a fucking bucket of water and I went over to his bunk and I fucking dumped the whole thing. And I was like, fuck him. So when he gets in his bunk, it's going to be a fucking pool. Fuck this oh. asshole. So, you know, show's over. We're, we're packed up. Da-da-da. We're all getting in a bucket. And you just hear this guy fuck. What the fuck? Fucking. Da-da-da-da. Who the fuck did this? I did. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> like, fuck you. <laughs> all right. And everyone's laughing and all this shit. And he's not going to do anything about it. But he's just fucking talking shit. And I was, I'll just take your fucking bunk. Da-da-da-da. Okay. Whatever, man. Whatever floats your boat. Fuck you. That happens. And then fucking dudes. None of us. But dudes on the tour are fucking wasted and shoving shit up their ass like fucking oranges. Wait, weren't they a straight edge band? Ignite? Hell no. <laughs> and they never were. They never nah, intended to be. Okay. Fucking maybe once. All right. First show. <laughs> no. Fucking wasted and fucking, which, you know, kind of entertaining. You're fucking <laughs> yeah. bored in Europe and, you know, can't find anything to eat. And what do you do? I oh, guess the you... one thing to eat, the orange. Oh, wait, he's shoving it up his ass. Okay, haha, funny. And then the acid fucking catches his, you know, rectum, and he's fuck freaking out and this that. Anyways, what? That's just fuck? a fucking crappy story. <laughs> so I uh, by the end of the, like the last week of the tour, we were just fucking fed up, and we're like, fuck these guys, whatever. And uh, <laughs> you know, we just hey, are we talking ahead. about an orange or like a Christmas orange, like a Satsuma? No, it was an orange. I like mean, he could. Blown orange. I mean, he was shoving, and it wasn't. It was breaking up. It wasn't going whole. Oh no! You know, so oh, okay, whatever. Anyway, so like orange, like he could have peeled it and just done orange slices. It would have been a lot easier. He could have just ate it, or like let Hands one of us eat place. it. But fuck, you know, f- fuck that logic. Right. You know, <laughs> um, whatever. And so, if Matt were here, this conversation would continue. Oh, he'd break okay. it down. Yeah. I mean, there was grapes at the time. Fucking who else knows? Maybe the TV remote. Who knows? So there, were, you just had There's a person just who just put everything up his ass. Pretty much. Just taking the uh, circle jerks a little too seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So by the end of that, the, the last couple nights, we were just fucking fed up. So the last show of the tour, we're like, hey, let's go out with a bang. This is going to be fucking awesome. So we play. And I mean, the shows over there were great. In the middle of that tour, we meet up with the earth crisis tour and that's with shifts on that tour. Mm-hmm. So that's how that connection starts with the other dudes. Anyways. So we jump ahead and we get to this last show we play. It's awesome. Somewhere in Germany and we're getting off stage and we're like, Hey, let's fuck with these guys. We're going to fucking, yeah, fuck them. And uh, we take a bunch of water and we throw it all over the stage because we want to electrocute them. Oh <laughs> Cause we're like these guys are pieces of shit. 
And so, <laughs> and the singer is like this germ freak. And so they start playing and we all fucking grab like basically everything in the green room uh, that you can throw. And we go out in the crowd and Ignite were pretty big over there at that time in 95. And we just fucking start chucking everything at them, which in turn, the audience thinks like, Oh, maybe it ignites into this. So they start throwing shit. So there's just shit there, and they're just dodging and getting pissed and all this stuff and getting electrocuted oh, with all the water. No. And then I'm like, oh, germ freak. Yeah, let's fucking throw dirty shit at them. And I don't know if it was Murph or Mark. Someone took their shirt off and basically wiped the floor, the show floor, where like just like, and it was raining out. There's just muddy dirt and like, and spilt beer and just fucking probably toilet water on the floor oh and just God. fucking throws it and it fucking just wraps around the singer's head oh and it was you just see him freak the oh. fuck out and we're just like this is the best time ever fucking awesome so ignite thanks for taking us on tour but fuck you too like whatever do you not have any relationship with anybody from ignite and all the no years i would run into zoli every once in a while the singer here and there um and he's just doing his career yeah. like it, th- th- that's what they were they were like a wanted to be a career band touring europe only right because no one gave a shit about them here outside of maybe socal or whatnot which is unfortunate because they came from bands that i loved you know and it's just like they went on to do things and you know that that was their thing they they didn't want anything to do with the community or whatever at the time and so it's like whatever wash your hands but anyway jump forward um we played this fest and um slap shout was on it and so not, right. not on the same tour. Not on the same tour. It was just two tours met. That's what happened in Europe a lot. Oh, so, right. you know, festivals would be booked and then bands would. But this is before this last show where you did all this stuff. Yes. This was okay. like, this was like second week into right, right. like, I think we were in Europe four or five weeks with them. So this is like second weekend and it's a weekend festival and the Slapshot tour is on this and. To, you know, festivals would be booked with, you know, all bands and, you know, uh, American hardcore bands and all this stuff. And so then tours would get routed around these. So yeah. it was like Temperance Under Tow Ignite, Slapshot, Wargasm, forget who the other band was. But that's how it, it all come. These festivals kind of come together on the weekends. And during the weekdays, you're out on your own tours. So we happened to land on this one where with the Slapshot tour. And I was fucking so excited because Slapshot was one of my favorite bands ever. And, you know, they never came here. And I was so excited to fucking see him. So, slash shots on stage. And it's this big airplane hangar packed with these PAs that have been brought in. So, they're just stacks, you know. And it's probably like 10 feet off the crowd type thing. And so, I'm like, okay, if they play Step On It, I'm going to climb to the top of this fucking PA stack. I'm going to do a flip off it into the crowd. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. No problem. Well... They're going to play the song, <laughs> and I fuck climb up to the top, and I'm psyched, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, no bad, it's packed. Uh, I'm totally going to get, I do a flip, and fucking no one catches me, and I land straight on my back. Oh, God. And I'm paralyzed. Oh. Damien and Ryan see me, and I can't get up, and the crowd just kind of around me, I'm just getting fucking fallen on, getting kind of crushed on stuff. Murphy and Damien fuck, push everyone around, pick me up. I'm like, dudes, I can't feel my legs. My, I'm Ooh. fucked. Oh. So they pull me over to the You merch really table. you really are Wolverine. I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was in so much pain. I was freaking out. I'm like, can I go to a hospital here? Are they gonna take me? Like, I'm just this American kid, like, what the fuck? There's some language barrier, like, I don't know what's gonna happen. The tour's over for us. I fucked my friends over. Like, how am I even gonna fly home? How do I call my folks? Just all this shit going through my head. And I'm just fucking numb. And I'm just like, oh, shit. And so, show's over. And those guys carry me back to the bus and th- put me in the bunk. And I'm just like, fuck, I'm going to try and sleep it off. I'm fucking just in pain all night and all this stuff. So, the next day, like the fucking bomb, just like, <laughs> power through it. And they're like, you know, well, let's take you to, like, whatever urgent care is there at yeah. the time. When we get to this club, the promoter can take you there. Well, the promoter takes me there. And, and it's like, yeah, we can't do anything for you. You don't have insurance. You don't. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, they're not going to see you. They're not going to take x-rays, all this stuff. Yeah. Like, what do you want to do? Uh, let's do the show. So for the like next five shows, I'm basically standing still. Oh, Jesus. Playing with kids just dogpiling me and jumping crazy. Whatever. It is what it is. Which, that's, and so I've had back problems 
since then from that show. Because when we get home, I actually go to a doctor and he's like, yeah, you've ruptured two discs. And so, but it's healed over. So oh. you're, you could do surgery and it might help. It might put you back, but you're always going to have back problems. Right. Which I always have, but it was just kind of like whatever up until a couple years ago. I don't know. Did you see me walking around with a cane for a while? Yeah. 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 That's from that injury all those years ago that just, it, it just left, you know, cartilage buildup around my discs and whatnot. And it was there. And I just happened to pick up my kids like Christmas presents and I dropped. Oh God. And it was the same thing. Oh no, man. Num- all numb, torn discs. Dude, Anyways. you got hurt. Okay. Let's do, we're going <laughs> to jump way, way, way back. Cause this is another, you injured at a show situation. Mm-hmm. This is an influential show. Yeah. Mouthpiece. Yeah. Undertow. Oh God. In Ryan Ryan's Murphy's garage. garage, where the botch dudes are there. Yeah. Right? Get crushed. In the crowd. And you got crushed during, was it cutting away? Probably. Or was it stalemate? One or the other. What happened to you? Because everyone dogpiled. Well, that was the thing. Well, now, did you just all, get all crushed sudden, under bodies? Oh, yeah. Like, but what was hurt? My back. Okay, that was another back. Yeah, thing. yeah, everything. Um, But the dog pile was like, yeah, dog pile, get on, do your thing. And then you get off. No one got off. <laughs> but that was kind of the thing. Like, I loved when that would happen. When the kids would just fucking jump on me. Yeah. And just pile up. It was fucking so, so awesome. I, I never saw, like, in any other places we played with other bands in their towns. I never sh- saw shit like that. You know, you have the yeah. kid come out, sing along, die, blah, 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 but not a pile of fucking kids on... One person. Anyway. Yeah, so there was that one, too. Okay, um, so we come home, and uh, the idea is start a new band. Chad from Strife has moved up to yeah, here, yeah, and he has the idea to start a dead guy-ish band. Right. And I'm like, yep, totally down. Um, our old friend Dan Dean is going to play drums. Absolutely. Damien's going to be in the band. And Mark. Yeah. And I'm going to sing. And it was very, and that was how the AMREP thing kind of starts coming in. Cause I'm like, it was good into today's the day we're, we're all into that. Like we're all moving and discovering this stuff. You know, Todd when, Graham, mm-hmm. who was living in the same apartment building that I was living mm-hmm. in at the time when this th- started coming around, this yeah. was kind of a, a new era of people hanging. This is before I moved in with my clan, right? Yeah. At the end, when you guys started, I remember him telling me, I like Nine Iron Spitfire better than I ever liked Undertale. Wow. And I was like, wow. Okay. Awesome. Quite a thing. Yeah. So, yeah. that And then start just, things are going quick. Like, all of us start new bands. Botch is Rising. Botch is Rising Trial. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Botch and Trial. And a bunch of other bands are starting to, like, you know, that's when, like, I'm starting to, like, state routes coming into mm-hmm. the fold and like a lot of east side kids um you know area 51 and you know the they're about to the start a little Devil band called started, the murder yeah Devils. exactly <laughs> so there's all this stuff happening everywhere you know mm-hmm. and um in my mind frame i'm like fuck all this i want to be in an angry band and i was in this mind frame with just I was just like, I, I don't know. Maybe it was just, uh, I just wanted to play shows in basements again and get that excited feeling again. Because, you know, yeah, we built this community and it was fun and awesome. And, it, you know, there's so much about it that I love, but there was a lot that was heavy. And it almost, for me, it felt like we had to play these shows. We had to put out these records for anything to happen in this community for a while. and. Th- when I started thinking that, then all these things started happening, you know, mm-hmm. and everyone's going, your label's going, uh, there's shows everywhere. Redmond Firehouse is on fire. Like, I mean, there's like always stuff to do, but I'm getting so, I'm removing myself from a lot of it, you know? And so we start Nine Iron and, um, Mendel puts out that seven inch on Indecision mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, Damien's in all the bands that all three of us do separately. You know, Mark starts doing Dempsey, and he's going in that quicksand vibe. And Murph starts Nothing Left, and they're going, like, super power violence crust uh, vibe. And then Nine Iron's doing the weird AMREP, techie, metal, whatever, hybrid thing. And we're all doing our things, but then Murph gets a call that Shift needs a drummer ASAP because their drummer left. And I don't know how they thought of Murph, but that guy, and Murph's gone. 
Mm-hmm. So there's one of my buddies that's gone. And um, Shift does a tour, and he decides to stay out there. And then Mark gets a call. Hey, you want to play guitar in Shift? Yeah, Shift is just draining people out of the Northwest. Boom. Mark's gone. And so at that time, um, one of my biggest regrets, not regrets, but something happened. And uh, I did something for selfish reasons. And you know where I'm going. Yeah. yeah. And which kind of ignited me to leave Seattle. Okay. I was just over everything. I was working at the Rock Candy Town for Lori LeFevre. And that's when I started getting um, into venue and doing bouncing and stuff like that. Stage manager at Rock Candy. Super awesome gig. It's where I met Derek from Murder City. We became homies and then get the call from Murph. Yo, dude, move to New York. Exactly. I fucking hate it here. I'm over this. I need change. I just need fucking new atmosphere. Um, and uh, the woman I was dating at the time. Hey, you want to move to New York? Yep. Boom. We're gone. We move. And the moment we get there, I split from her. <laughs> But it's fine because we have. <laughs> I, we actually move in with a Murph and his lady at the time in Queens, New York, and uh, I was at that time. I was also working as a stock manager for Banana Republic. I'd been there mm. for a number of years yeah. through our old friend Derek Fredrickson got me the job. Yes, so I was doing that during the day and then bouncing and rock candy at night. Anyways, uh, moved to New York. Boom, I'm gone, ready to go, and I moved to New York. But a couple days before, I'm working at Rock Candy, and Aaron Edge, an old, old friend, had started this band called Himsa mm-hmm. with Derek from Trial and Brian from Trial, and they're going to be this weird political band kind of thing, and he's like, we want you to sing. And I'm like, oh, I'm moving to New York in three days, because I wasn't telling anyone I was moving. Yeah. I was going to pick up and leave. Yeah. Didn't care. Was gone. And he's like, oh, shit. Crazy. So that happens. I moved to New York. And I got to transfer with Banana Republic to run their stock room in like upper Manhattan. Didn't know what I was getting myself into, but it was a job. I needed a job right away. It was fine. It was a graveyard thing. Go in there. It's a wreck. I mean, think New York City, a Banana Republic there that's like, you know, fancy and all this stuff. The the stock room was just fucking shambles. It was just like fucking shit thrown everywhere. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this job until I make this stock room how it should be and then i'm out i'll figure out something i'll do maybe i'll just go work and by then i was like going to shows at coney island high i'll just fucking schmooze my way and hustle and meet people and try and get in clubs well uh megan my girlfriend well she had turned to be my ex but we were still tight we were like we were friends and uh we were tight like that she was getting into uh like club scene and whatnot and uh making connections in the fashion scene and all that stuff because that's what she was gonna go there for and ends up that she knows someone that's doing this club night for jarvis cocker who is the singer of pulp yeah a band i love because i love brit pop i love pulp thanks and uh, he does this night, and I become the door person. He's doing the night that. in New York. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he has this night in New York, and I become the door person. So I start getting into that scene of like working the fucking, fucking stupid rope thing yeah. kind of thing. But dudes that do that make a shit ton of money because people throw money at you to get in. Right. But that only lasts a couple weeks. But for me, I'm like, holy shit, this is my end. I'll do this. I'll try and fucking get a job at Coney Island. I'll just use my connections of who I'm knowing. Uh, you know, Big Rich is out there. Yada, yada, yada. Just trying to do my thing. I come home to surprise my folks for Christmas. While I'm home, Murph calls me. And he's moving out. Him and his lady break up. He's moving out. Uh, he's an ensign by then. And uh, and I'm fucking like, shit. What am I going to do? Like, I'm fucking living with my ex and his ex. <laughs> I don't really like. And, uh fuck what am i gonna do and he calls me he's like sick of it all need a guitar tech and i'm all no kidding and he's like yep you should do it i was like i don't know i played guitar but fuck it why not so when i get back i start going to their practices because then sick of it all huge in europe and um pete just shows me how he does his thing and that's how i get like touring gig starts and so i go back i don't do the club thing but now republics i quit that two weeks later i'm in europe was sick of it all and ensign and indecision that's the tour and um i have no idea what i got myself into (laughs) because the first show is in belgium in front of thousands of people and i'm like 
oh shit, they're bigger than I thought. And <laughs> they re- need a real guitar tech. I'm just winging it. And I make it through. And uh, I w- the first two, three nights, I was fucking cracked, Dave. I was in my bunk, just stressed. The most stress I've ever had in my life because I left sick of it all. That band Wait, has been so... so when you met with him to go over how to do the job, you just let on like you played guitar? No, they no. I told them. They I'm like, knew. I don't know how to string a guitar. I know what a guitar is. And they were like, I know how cool? To, to, yeah. They, they like, cool. What we'll they do. wanted was someone to... They didn't have any more guys. Mm-hmm. And they needed someone that would learn as they go. And they didn't have to pay a real tech prices type thing. Because roadies are fucking expensive. Yeah. You yeah. know? And so I was willing to try it. And it's with Sick of It All. I love Sick of It All. One of my so favorite this bands stress, of all time. So this stress was you putting it on you. Myself. Yeah. Hmm. I didn't want to fail. No, I've never yeah. failed at anything. And I always try. Yeah. So it was like, fuck. I was cracked. I mean, that first <laughs> night, dude, I'm in the bunk, curtain closed, in tears. Oh, like, God. fuck, dude, I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to let them down. You know, all this other stuff. And I'll tell you this, because I, I was just back in Philly um, with the wife's family mm-hmm. and stuff. And I went to Asbury Park and got to hang out with some of the old Ensign guys and stuff. And Tim from Ensign, who used to roadie for sick of it all, knew what I was going through. And he fucking helped me because he used to guitar tech for Pete. Oh, and yeah. he's like, dude, I got you. I'll help you. And I will always remember that. I mean, it's been on and off with Ensign because, you know, with the Murph vibe and Murph being my boy. And yeah, like, yeah. it got weird with that and anything. But I was fucking who under was the bridge. He was there for me. And it was awesome. And, uh, he helped me through it, and in a couple of days, I was comfortable. It was real good, all this stuff. It was fine. Cool. But about two weeks into the tour, they're like, our next one's going to be with Slayer. And I'm like, <laughs> in my head, I'm like, this is fucked. Like, I can't I can't guitar tech for you on a Slayer tour. Are you kidding me? Like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to fucking do this. Why would that have... Was your that's job fucking going to huge. get harder? Well, no, because I had already been working in, like, venue yeah. uh, scenarios. Yeah. And Slayer is theater scenarios. Yeah. You need a professional in that kind of realm, not someone that's been guitar teching so for three you, weeks. So you're going to, okay, so you're literally not just getting the guitar ready for him. You're getting his whole stage sound ready? Basically, yes. Uh, not, not doing the sound, but getting it prepared as a support act. Not Sick mm. of All was headlining on this, so yeah. we go in at load in time. I have lots of time. I have three or four hours to set up the rigs. And Sigvall was very easy to set up. Yeah. It's a guitar, bass, and they had a drum tech. Yeah. You know, I worked for Pete and Craig, got a thing, made sure Lou wasn't caught up. His mic cords weren't caught up. Everything's fine. And it's easy, easy. It's a hardcore show. Yeah. Slayer's professional. Things on time. You have 15 minutes to set up, get it checked, go, and the band's on. <laughs> I was like, no, I, and I stood on it for a fucking week. Oh, I and I remember going into the, into the green room, into the dressing room to say, well, and just like, guys, I got to talk to you. Um, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't do, go on Slayer tour with you. Like, this is wow. insane. They're like, no, you're doing a good job. This is great. I was like, yeah, I understand that. It's not really the career I really want to go in. I, this is not what I want to do with my life. Like touring's awesome. It's fun. Uh, I, I'm not a guitar player. You need a real tech type thing. Which was awesome for them because they got his buddy Warren, who's a New York guy, and he's been, now he works for like Slayer. Oh, wow. Huge metal, Lamb of God, stuff like that. Um, I haven't seen him in a long time, but I we follow each other on things, and it's like, I'm glad I made that decision because that he took off and made a career for himself, you know, kind of thing and whatnot. So we get back, and Ensign's like, well, where are you going to go on, you know, a year-long tour kind of thing? Why don't you just be our tour manager? So that's how I got into tour managing. And I was like, well, I can do that because it's the same kind of shit I did at venues. And that that was easy because it's just calling advancing. It's what stuff you do with Undertow trying to get to the next show. Yeah. I was like, that would just come easy. And so I move all my shit from Queens, say bye to Megan, and move to New Jersey and New Brunswick into this fucking giant old frat house I turned into a, a apartment loft thing. Me, Murph, Ken's from Ensign. These two girls they knew from college, a couple of their <laughs> friends. There was like ten of us sure. in this place, and it was fucking awesome. It was I was living in a closet. It was nice. great. I, I had my record collection, my f- clothes on the floor folded right there, a mat in the middle, and that's where I slept. Unless we went on tour. People who have lived in those scenarios, yeah, when they tell the stories, they always talk about how awesome it was. <laughs> it was so I'm much sorry. fun. There's something about camping out in the house you live in that is. <laughs> 
It's just it's incredible. I once lived in a fort that I built. Yeah. Oh, so great. when I was a full blown adult, yeah, I like m- took blankets and hung them from the ceiling and made a room, and <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, it's, it's so fun, <laughs> so fun. And Michael so, Ann didn't yeah. think it was awesome. Of course not. No. Okay. no. <laughs> um, so yeah, did that and uh, went on tour with Ensign. Met a bunch of new people that I'm still friends with today, and uh, yeah, it was a good time hanging out in New Jersey. And then just, you all I did was work for Ensign. I didn't have a job. Yeah, I'd come home with enough money to scrape by, and like in New Brunswick, we knew the cheap places to go eat, and then we go see shows and yeah. this, that, and the other, and so you know, craziness. It's what's funny. It would I just recollection of living in new jersey and going to like the melody bar and seeing shows there and whatnot um just before the whole new york thing came up i was fucking wanting to move and um you remember justin suburban mm-hmm. uh me and him were ho- close then and you know, he'd come out to visit because you know we met him with the mouthpiece guys in new jersey you know years before and uh he's like yeah, you should move out to Philly. You should travel for this band. And I'm like, oh, what band is this? And he's like, Kid Dynamite. And I'm like, oh, shit. So those guys sent me the demo, and I wrote some lyrics to Kid for the Kid Dynamite demo. And so I flew to Philly and tried out. And I got the, uh, you're too, <laughs> you're too negative. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice, because that kid Jason that actually sang for the band perfect for oh it. yeah yeah it was funny so i i started thinking about new jersey and i thought of that that story <laughs> that was pretty fucking rad uh so ended up not at moon philly moved to new york all that happened and then um ensign toured a crap ton and um then one day like murph was just fucking super unhappy and wanted to move home and go to college and we're sitting in new brunswick in that frat house and like it's winter time and I think it's almost Christmas or just after Christmas. And we didn't go home to see your folks or anything. And he's like, I'm done. I'm ready to go home. And I'm like, yeah, I think I am too. I'm, I'm burnt out at this. And uh, he's like, let's move home. I'm like, okay. He's like, no, like tomorrow. And I'm like, really? <laughs> he like, he's like yeah. fast. Oh yeah. I'm like, okay. We boxed our shit, rented a truck, came up to everybody. Hey, we're moving. We're going back to Seattle. We love you all. Thanks for everything. Got in the van and drove straight to Seattle. Oh, God. 55 hours straight through the gnarliest snowstorms we've ever been through. But it was awesome. So we get to Seattle. Oh, and this is the whole reason why we wanted to come so quickly. So at that time, there was this band blowing up called Buck Cherry. <laughs> and we loved that record. Lit up. It was nonstop playing on the Ensign Tour. We loved that. And my sister said... Oh my god, sorry. <laughs> my sister's like, Hey, oh, you're moving home? Cool. Buck Cherry's playing the show box in like four days. So and you, I told Murph that. <laughs> so you were trying and to And that totally Buck ignited Cherry. us to make the Buck Cherry show. Jesus I sorry. <laughs> I made it to the Buck Cherry show. It was oh, amazing. That is so, so good. Awesome. Yeah. Buck Cherry. So give me a time frame. This is ninety This is seven. I eight. moved in ninety end of ninety seven. I moved home the end of 99 into 2000. That December, January, that right in that spot. John, how were you in Edge of Quarrel? Well, that was before I moved, right? Oh, sorry. I moved in 98. Weren't we filming Edge of Quarrel in 97? Something's wrong with our time. Is it? Yeah. Was filming in 98, editing in 99, came out in 2000. And I thought you were here the whole time. No. I did my stuff and then I moved. Did we just knock out all of your stuff? Maybe. Oh, there was so there was a long period of time where I wasn't filming anything. Yeah. Or I was just trying to pick up scenes. And I think oh, you yeah. were back in town and I said, I need you to come over to my house. Oh, you're right. To do I basically I have to get you to record clean audio for every line you did in the movie. And we sat in front of my TV in the front yeah. room. So were you just visiting? At that time I think so. Okay. Totally forgot the edge of quarrel. Wow, what a whole thing, dude! Yeah, you what the you, fuck. You were a main character in that, Ooh, but we and knocked you out. made it, <laughs> wrote we, it. We oh boy, <laughs> yeah, I have it. That's it's dude. in my IMDb. See, I can't even remember that scenario. Of it was the summer of ninety seven. Filming something. all the the, the there's chase a, scenes. Yeah, and there's a. It's hard it's a to blur. get my head around how long it took to make. I feel like I started it in 98 and it was done by 2000, but it may have been 97. It, yeah. I don't know how I can time that, like figure that out. I have shit somewhere that has dates on it, but I've, I thought, I've said it wrong. I thought I moved January or 
sorry, December 97. Could be. No, no, no. I thought it was October because I came back to, because I only worked at Banana Republic for like a short amount of time. I come home, Murph's like sick of all needs a tech. And that was over a Christmas break when I was home. So there was a, my- there was a hardcore two weeks where we filmed with you almost every day. Yeah. And that was the beginning of filming. That might've yeah. been the fall of 97. Yeah. And then I did all this pickup stuff, whatever I could in 98. Mm-hmm. And then there was, and you see what you're talking about though, like rock candy shows were happening and Ensign was constantly coming through and mm-hmm. playing. And I was at those shows mm-hmm. and sometimes getting footage at those shows. Yeah. And if that was when you were out with touring, that makes sense. You would yeah. have left. Well, so when, I when was that last done. undertow show at rock candy oh, God, I... with murder city, botch and Ensign? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Cause Murph was in Ensign. Right. When he came back around. Because Murph was in Ensign when I moved to New York. Okay. He just I wasn't living in New York. I don't have the time. Oh, my God. See, it's And we've mess. been doing this so long. I could drag Two Lex's hours. magic list of shows out of the oh closet, God. and we could Insane. figure it out. It's going to take forever. <laughs> but um, so then I would run into people who had been in it. And like, mm-hmm. So it's like middle of 99, mm-hmm. and I'm editing, and it's taking me months and months and months to edit it. And so yeah. people would be like, yeah, remember when you were making that movie? And I'm like, oh, yeah. oh no, I'm still yeah. working on it literally yeah. every day. Yeah. Man, that was a lot of time and effort for something that is what it is. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. (laughs) And then you came out and did the, when did we do the photos with Deanna and Aaron? (laughs) For the cover. That was 99, I think. But I don't know. Maybe maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Because I was going to come out for the last Rock Candy show and I ended up not coming. I was, there so was when did you tour. get back to Seattle? What was the year? You I thought? think January 2000. Oh, wow. Okay. Or right at the end of December 99. And then not too I long mean, after it was the that, winter. you do get into HIMSA. Yeah. So I'm home. I go back to work for Banana Republic because it was an easy hire to go back there. And at that time, by then, when I come back, the teen dance ordinance is gone. Yep. Rock candy's gone, though. But... All the bars in town can do all ages shows. Yeah. And Lori is still doing infinite productions and hires me back as her stage manager. And I get back into the venue scene and I'm just working. Right. It's just ah, an amazing moment happened. So I moved back where I currently work now. El Corazon was called Graceland when I moved back. And it had, I think it had been the off ramp before that off ramp where all the Seattle got their start. You know, Pearl Gems first show was on that stage as Mookie Blaylock. For all you people that are into that shit. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, uh, that week I moved home, Botch was playing a show. And I'm going to, like, fuck, yeah, I'm going to go see Botch. Yeah. Botch is fucking huge. Oh, Botch has I'm, become... I'm blown away. Yeah. Botch is fucking huge and fucking... I, I loved him before. I fucking loved him. After this show, when they played, it was so impressive. They're playing, but it's a different crowd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, I don't know these kids because I've been gone for however long. But it's like a different type of crowd. It's not like the old hardcore shows and lots of stage diving. Now it's just like a movement and, you know, chaotic. But there's not like kickboxing. There's not. It's just a different vibe. Total different vibe. So I'm like, fuck this. I'm going to go head walk, (laughs) jump on stage, and I fucking head walk. And some other fucker grabs me and pulls me up. And it's a security guard from where like, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, pow, fuck you. Don't touch me, motherfucker. And the set stops and Dave comes over. He's like, no, that's our friend. And the bouncer's like, I'm doing my job. I'm like, fuck you. I've been doing your job for 10 years. You know what the fuck you're doing. You're at a hardcore show. Blah, blah, blah. And this guy's a. Uh, this guy turned out to be Fred Bush, who's a dude I'm still homies with. <laughs> he ended up being a bartender at Graceland for years, and we always talk. I just he moved away to de- to Texas, uh-huh. and uh, he just was in town six eight months ago, and we brought up that story of how we met. It's so funny. It's like, dude, you fucking hit me for no reason. I'm like, no, you put your hands on me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyways, so anyways, yeah. So that I come home. There's that show, and I'm like, holy shit, Botch is fucking, that's going on. And a couple weeks later, Spicoli, who's still in, Brian Johnson, mm-hmm. who's still in HIMSA at the time, HIMSA had gone through some changes. Aaron Edge had left the band. The singer that they got, Christian, had left on a tour. Mm-hmm. Got weird. Uh, I had heard what HIMSA was doing when I was on the East Coast. Wasn't feeling it. Um, actually, no, no, I take that back. When I come home... There's that box show, and then there's a paradox. The paradox is going on, and there's a Himsa show. And 
they're doing their show, but it's like a fake riot thing. And there's like people dressed up in riot gear and the yeah. band's playing. And I mean, it's a packed show and there's like people with, you know, protest signs, all this shit going on. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Okay. Was it him's what? Halloween show? One of theirs? Oh, well, before was... I was in the band. Okay, yeah, yeah, before this... I was in the band. It was right. still that tough. But there were some songs that were kind of like, I was grooving on. Like, yeah, I was they... just like, it, it was still weird when stuff, they, that, but then they, they were came, getting... When they came out with that first 7-inch, uh-huh. there was some sick... I mean, that was pretty cool. That first song yeah, yeah. was awesome. Oh, yeah. And there's still stuff on that first LP that I'm like, yeah, I was into it at the time. For, for sure, sure, for sure. But I wasn't. Because right. when I was in New York, all I was listening to was At The Gates. <laughs> Dude, honestly, I went through this, like, I don't want to listen to hardcore. I'm yeah. not buying it. One, I was broke. I was yeah. a poor kid out there. Um, I wasn't buying it. Uh, I was just listening to what I had, and I was fucking super into, like, Swedish death metal, and, like, fucking Entombed, and Obituary, and I was just engulfing myself in, like, death metal, and shit like that. That was just what I was going on. But, if Sheer Terror was playing, I was going to see Sheer Terror at Coney Island, or yeah. fucking whatever. So, I come home, and I'm not thinking about being in a band or anything, I'm just gonna come home, live my life, fucking see what happens, and... You know, I get my job back at Banana Republic. I get my job back at the venues and stuff. I see Botch. I go to that Himsa show. It's just like, holy shit, there's a fucking a lot of kids still doing their thing. And there's a lot of new bands. It's fucking exciting times. Murder City's fucking huge. It's just a fucking good time in Seattle. And uh, that show happens. And a couple weeks later, Spicoli hits me up and is like, hey, man. So, yeah, Christian's not in the band anymore. And, um, you know, Aaron Edge isn't, hasn't been in it. And it was him. Derek, EJ was in the band at the time, and um, Mike was still playing drums. Uh, would you want to be in the band? And I'm like, oh, dude, I don't... I respect, I love you guys. I fucking, you know, we've known each other a long time. It's not really my thing that I want to do. And Spicoli's an old metalhead. And he's mm-hmm. like, well, I have these songs that weren't fitting it, but the guys are into it. And you want to just come in and try it? So I was like, yeah, I'll come in. I come in and it's metal. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm digging this. This is awesome. I'm, I'm totally in. And let's fucking start a band. And Derek's like, no, let's keep the name. We're already <laughs> running with it. And, you know, we're already on, they're already on Rev. Rev's into like putting out a record with you on it. Hmm. Um, Let's see what happens. So we record the Death is Infinite 7 inch. Rev puts it out and it kind of just fucking sparks from there. And uh, Spicoli bounces, EJ bounces, we get Josh Freer and Kirby Johnson, old dudes from hardcore scene, and they come in, and then it's like full-on metal, <laughs> and it's awesome. And, you know, we're just like, what do we want to play? Fucking at the gates, riffs, and I want to sing in a different way. And, uh, yeah, hence it takes off, and we go on tour forever. <laughs> and can I, can I... Back up? What's that? You're going to back up? No, I'm not going to back up, but then uh, you guys... Record courting tra- or cor- courting you- tragedy, courting tragedy and disaster, mm-hmm. and ask me if I'll put out the vinyl, mm-hmm. which is rad. And you guys were on my Power of Ten compilation, yeah, which was a ten song. I wanted one minute songs from people. Voldemir, yeah, it's great. It's about the van, right? Yep. Um, and Josh and and you made up a word for it, which I love. <laughs> made up a word. Rampid. Oh yeah. It's not a word. <laughs> oh, it's not. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's rampant <laughs> and rapid mixed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do that a lot. That's fine. But dude, <laughs> seriously, that's it. I mean, there's handwritten lyrics in there. I'm like, it says rampant. <laughs> so fantastic. I love it. And I, it totally, I was like, all right. Yeah. Beast Rome's rampant. Yeah. Hell yes, it does. Kill it. Well, yeah. it's a van. It's yeah. a van that's creature. It was. So it doesn't Gus, comport here to, to the there. rules. Nah, so no rules. years after yeah. I put out the picture disc of that record, which is a fantastic record. We're right looking there. at some right here. I believe I texted you and said, I'm rereading one of my favorite books, and I caught you. <laughs> Can I? Is it all right if I tell this story? Oh, for sure. I may have actually said it before. So I'm reading The Vampire Lestat, which, mm-hmm. by the way, if you've read the, if you know Interview with the Vampire, yeah. The Vampire Lestat is book two in the series, and it's really where it takes off because it's where Lestat says, Louis, Louis told all these lies about me, but I forgive him. I'll tell you what really happened. And then you hear basically the story of his life. And when he's still alive before he's been turned to a vampire, he says, I was always courting tragedy and disaster. And I'm reading it and I hadn't read the book for years. And I threw it down and just texted you. I caught you. (laughs) Vampire Lestat. And I think he texted back like, yep. Yep. (laughs) 
<laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm super... I don't know if people know that. They probably don't know <laughs> where it came from unless they re- read yeah. Anne Rice. But obviously how I looked then and the things I was into and whatnot, um, you know. I yeah. recommend people read every book in the vampire series yeah. and the, and the yeah. Taltos ones because those yeah. fit in. Yeah. You gotta do it. Yep. Um, yeah. Super in a vampire lore. <laughs> those great. are good books, man. So good. Sorry. And I mean, a lot of lyric influence from those things. I think my not? favorite one is Memnock and people would be like, oh. what the hell? Why would you even like that? It's not even really a vampire book. True. It's awesome. Yeah. Have you ever read her son stuff? No, me neither. I've read these last couple ones she wrote and totally yeah. dug them. I don't know how yeah. people feel about them, but they're yeah. weird. Are they? Yeah, yeah they the, stopped the... reading and just picked up uh, dude, wrestling biographies. and <laughs> Dude, the one that just came out, like the last one she did, uh-huh. Prince Lestat and the Realms of Atlantis. It's about space people creating Atlantis. Whoa. It's awesome. Is it good? <laughs> yes. Oh, shit. It Cur- is. It's weird, yeah. but it's good. Yeah. Currently reading the Suede autobiography. Oh, really? So, yeah, it's incredible. I had no idea Ricky Gervais was their manager when they started. God, no, me either. Nobody knows. Well, some people do, but <laughs> it's, it's in the book. like yeah, it's in the first ten pages. I'm like, get out of here. That's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So Hempson takes off, and we we're like, went for it. Yeah, and that's. I mean, we that's... really went for it. I mean, so the funny thing is, the last time you were here, you said, "Oh, we're gonna have a reunion," and then uh, it now it's two and a half years later, and I saw it, you two weeks ago. Yep, at a little dive bar <laughs> called the Kraken, a and we were loose bar. chili, and we are playing a festival next Saturday, playing said record, courting tragedy and disaster in its entirety. Nice to put it to rest, write some new songs. Who knows? So you guys are. Who knows what you guys are doing? Uh, yeah, we've been playing again. Still... Um, we did we did that. So we did the that reunion when we were talking years ago. Uh, it was super fun, awesome. I mean, kids flew in from everywhere. Uh, it was insane for me personally. It was a total bummer. I had the flu real bad and uh, was super sick. And for me, I was like, it sucks. Like this is us getting back together. So much fun and playing with these guys again it was amazing. And uh, but for me personally, it was I was pretty bummed. And, uh, then, uh, I've been doing heiress for all these years and big rich moved from New York, married our friend, Carrie, mm-hmm. Whitney, they just had a child, just had a child. Congratulations, <laughs> mommy, puppy. And, uh, so Northwest terror fest is this fest that's started last year here. It's a guy that does the Austin one. So, um, incredible fest of like underground metal, doom, yada, yada, yada. And uh, Eris played it last year. And right when we got off stage, the dude doing it, Joseph was like, hey, um, yeah, so next year we're going to go in more of a hardcore vein because Rainfest had stopped. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to kind of pick up the momentum from that, but still keep it dark and, you know, heavy or side of hardcore, you know. And um, would Undertow want to play? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> I-, I don't want to do that. And uh, he's like, oh, okay. Well, you know. Maybe Himsa. And I'm like, ah, nah, I don't know. Uh, no. Nah. A couple weeks later, Big Rich had the idea of starting Rainfest again. But in his own vein of things. And it would be a one-day thing. Bang it out. Get some big headliners. And do it. So he calls me. He's like, would Himsa play? And I'm like, I never want to be the no guy. Even when we were asked about these other ones, I'm kind of like, I can ask the other guys, but I don't want to be that guy. I really don't have to do anything except yell on a mic. Mm. So that happened, and everyone was like, yes. So then the festival guy, Joseph, Northwest Terror Fest guy, is like, hey, does him want to play? And I'm like, hey, guys, we got offered to do these two fests. One's Big Riches, Old Homie. One's this one. What do you want to do? And the guys were like, yeah, why not? Let's do it. Cool. Awesome. And uh, I call Rich back, and I'm like, we don't want a headline. <laughs> we want to play like five or six songs, 20-minute set, <laughs> be in the middle somewhere, not make it a big thing, just play a show, have fun, we're done. Well, Rich's Fest and Northwest Terror Fest are a week apart from each other. <laughs> so we're like, fuck, how's this going to work? I get them in touch, so they talk. Chad, our drummer, was like, hey, it's the anniversary of Courting Tragedy Disaster 15 years. We should do it in its entirety. And at the moment, it was like, oh, everyone was like, yeah, that would be fun. Cool. Rad. Awesome. So we we're going to play the small set for Rich, do the courting thing for the fest. Rich ends up, getting, they get pregnant. They're going to have a kid. I can't do the fest. Cool. Less pressure. We're going to do the courting thing. 
we start practicing and we're playing i mean five songs we never played live really fuck i wrote a lot of lyrics for songs and it's <laughs> Been a pain in the ass. <laughs> so that was the whole reason why we played the Kraken show, to play the show, the songs we were yeah. never played live to make it comfortable, and it was awesome. So yeah. after that, we were all, like, hanging out outside, and we were like, hey, that was super fun. We should write some songs. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what was going to happen? I don't know. It's always... But the Himsa, the Himsa time was awesome. It was fun. We did a lot of things that I never thought I'd do. I mean, we played in Russia, of all places. Yeah. Like... The band went to Southeast Asia and did touring. And in that time, I didn't do that tour. Our friend Chris LaPointe sang on that one mm. um, for me. Because at that time, when I came home, I started tour managing Botch mm -hmm. and doing the light stuff for them. And they had a tour already That's right. booked. You, and I really wanted to do it that. It really felt like the lights became an instrument. The first time I did it with them, I was behind the cabs uh -huh. and doing it. And it was awesome. And then I think the guys wanted to step it up. And me being just like this hardcore punk dude, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not an LD. I'm not a lighting director. I don't know what you want. <laughs> and they're like, no, we want the same thing, but we want you part of the show. And Dave was like, and you can do backup vocals. So they gave me the mic too. And so my dad and I built this light, light box thing where I could duct tape power strips to it and then <laughs> run the the brights and run the colors and run Damn, the dude. strobes. And that's thing happened. Those shows were... That was fun. Unreal. That was fun. That last rock candy so was sick. But then, you know, they did that. I love it. I love the ending with you just smashing the lights during the very cool. end of We Are the Romans. Yeah. There's that a, was super uh, fun. There's, you can't see it as clearly because, unfortunately, on the DVD that came out, mm. it doesn't, I mean, it, it focuses on the band, which mm -hmm. is good. For sure. Right? But there's clear shots of you breaking all the lights, uh, and so I did an alternate edit of <laughs> the of the last oh, no show oh. that you can find on, because I had I shot the footage. Yeah, it, it, we we were there yeah, shooting yeah. footage, so I had all the footage. So if you want to see that final encore, um, the way I saw it, oh, and it focuses on the you smashing the lights, uh -huh. and it focuses on like. Uh, Brian be, jump, doing the stage oh, drive, and yeah. then them trying to pull him off the stage, and everyone jumping that bouncer, yeah. and uh, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, it's got you know you're smashing all the lights. It's on. It's been on YouTube for years. No it was shit. one of the first things I, I put no up. Idea. So it's just a. It's you know if you've seen the DVD, you've seen it, or if you were at the show, you saw it. Uh -huh. But this is just another take on oh, it. Oh, killer! Good times. We is made that, it. I think we're well. You, I mean, we just jumped ten years, but. We I mean, did, we did, but yeah. that's how it happens because yeah. um, we are coming up on three hours of recording time, like last time, and it'll be like you said, it'll it'll be edited down yeah. with some some stuff that we have to take yeah. out. We uh we really spilled some secrets, <laughs> so we'll cut those out, yeah. and you all can just imagine Whatever. what it was we talked about. I'm going? trying to think if there's anything that that stands out that I really wanted to like, you know, kind of call you out on. Do it in a good way. Do it. I don't know, man. You've been such a ever present part of my life, even you when too. you're not around. Yeah. Like and I think about Life the funny thing is all that stuff that you talked about, being in Europe and being on the East Coast and doing all that shit. Yeah, you weren't here, but I don't think of it that way. Like that's why I can't figure out how you still play one of the main roles in Edge of Quarrel during that time you were gone. Yeah. Like we we must have filmed all of your parts before you left. And then I just filled in everything else with everybody else until you came back. And I yeah. didn't know you were coming back. Yeah. But I didn't know I was. Yeah. But it's just, yeah, there's always, uh, there's always been you. And you. And Straight Edge. And Straight Edge. <laughs> uh, what do you want people to know going out here? Uh, you know what we didn't uh, talk about? We didn't talk about that guy's thumb. Oh. We ended the last one talking about that guy's thumb. Did I talk about it and you cut it out? Oh, no, it's in there. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh. Shit. <laughs> we did that at the end of the last episode. We did the, we did this, the handshake snap. Oh yeah. That I can't do. And then I said, you can't do it. And I said, at least you've got a thumb. True fact. He don't. <laughs> you only got one. See, no one knows what we're talking about. No. You got to go back and listen to episode 24 to know what we're talking about right now. You got basically about, you're going to have about five hours of John Pettibone conversation. Fucking, I'm so sorry. And we've, <laughs> whatever, dude. And this is, uh, this is You'll what You'll never do. get those hours back. Hey, I've, uh, to get ready for this one, I listened back to the old one and I, yeah. I enjoyed it even though yeah. it was me. Like I enjoyed hearing you. <laughs> right on. I like hearing the other ones. All right. So let's do it again. Uh-oh. You know how to do it? Yeah, I can't do it. Doesn't Matt do it? Or no, he does the... Who? Matt? Who? Hat. Um, that dude. <laughs> Handshake. Snap. 
I do handshake snap. You just but do you, a handshake and then you snap and point with point your finger. But do you do the shake, pull away, snap and point? Oh, what is that? Who does that? Um, no, there's this one. What's his name? Rainfest Matt. That could be it. You kind of pull your fingers off like a snap. Oh. Rain, oh, Matt Weltner. Weltner, thank you. Good dude. Yeah. Solid dude. Yeah. That's one of my That's one of my good friends. Still? Oh, yeah. Excellent. He's, we played poker at his house like a week ago. Nice. Yeah, he's a good guy. Killer. Um, That whole crew. Uh, what I love, I'll tell you. What I love about the wave of people that came in in the hardcore scene around that paradox era. Yeah. The young ones. Mm-hmm. The ones that basically... A lot of the people that were part of like NorthwestHardcore.com. Yeah. So many of those people are just lifers. Yeah. There's a there's just a larger group of them mm-hmm. that feel like they're still and it it was weird because they came into something that was more established, but for whatever reason, like it felt like they were able to like maybe this is it, right? There was more ground for them to sink their roots into. There you go. That could very well be mm-hmm. it. Um so yeah, all so many of those people are just awesome. Still good friends yeah. of mine to this day. I haven't started having those people on the podcast I can't yet. Wait, because at, when I started this podcast, I said I had to know you for fifteen years, and mm-hmm. now all of them <laughs> are in that fifteen years in that, in yeah. that group. That's so we'll awesome. start getting some newer people in yeah. before too long. But I've yeah. still got a lot of older dudes to get to. You do, and if, and man, I mean, you know, some of them I've missed. I've yeah. missed my shot because they're gone. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. And so I've got to get who I can get when I can get them. Yeah. And that's, I'm not trying to bring everything down, but God, I just did. Nah. But we know. We know. Mm-hmm. Then a couple people don't get to be on. Yeah. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> <laughs> no, <funny>. Edit it. <laughs> I'm going to edit all so much of this. All right, dude. But thank you so much for coming out. Who, who is, who's the one, ooh, name three that you want and that are still with us that you probably couldn't get oh i've tried to get pete pete kramick i hope i said you're like, kramick uh, Kr- uh, from verbal salt he, oh yeah because he lived here he's in, he's in oh yet. that's right but he has actually made a little bit of noise like it might be possible oh that would be amazing i would love no it i did not know way. him back then but no. i have met it i do know him yeah a little bit so. oh i would love um, to hear that there's talk i don't even want to say this one out loud because someone called me up and said um I'm not going to say who this is. Okay. Uh, this is someone who I know, but I don't know. This is someone who would be one of the bigger people I've ever had on the show. Okay. And they said, I want you to do this interview. Uh, I'm going to try to make it happen. So I'm, I'm going to leave it out there. Okay. Like exciting. Cause that would happen fairly soon if yeah. it did. Yeah. Um, How about someone locally, a local person. Yeah. Who I haven't been able to get. Yeah. I've got a notebook around here somewhere with the yeah. list of all the people that I want on the show. Yeah. Um, Greg Anderson would be cool. Yeah, he's but he's well, he's local from the past. Yeah, I know, right? but I mean, and that is still doing. Oh, it would be very interesting. Musical of yeah, Steve I would love O'Malley. To hear it. O'Malley would be killer <laughs> be just so to see him fun. come. Like yeah, when he was <laughs> running around with us. Um, he's in high school. So funny. Oh God, I, I know. you know I haven't thought. Do you know what the whole um basically our whole like California friend base yeah is on my list yeah but like i haven't you know taken yeah. the what about dave rowan yeah oh i'll t- you know what here you here you go no this is the answer okay this is the answer yeah i have asked in person face to face and been told no Ooh. but i want andrea zolo on this show she said no in a in the sweetest politest way right like Oh, it'd be so awesome. I want Andrea Zolo on this show. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. So, and Kate Becker. Oh, that'd be great. That's, I mean, that, that could happen. That's in the works. Yeah. But it, it's, I mean, it's been oh, in the works for a long that. time. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But let me tell you, um, I want to get into it with Zolo in that yeah. seat. Yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so that's what, what that would be. Oh, yeah. totally. She cut my hair. It's the only haircut I've had since 2012. No way. Yeah. I'll give you one. <laughs> High and tight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could go back. Yeah. yeah. Michael Enzo want me to cut my hair. No, she doesn't. She likes it. She doesn't want me to shave the beard. Yeah. Here's Leah. Yeah, I don't know what's up with this one. I, I actually just cut like five inches off. It was like off ZZ your, top. It was much. Yeah, when yeah, you walked in, I thought. Gross, you, it's funny like, because I, I can't the picture of, of us 
I'll put the picture up of us that I took when we were outside before we started recording. Mm -hmm. And people could see that you have a big beard. Mm -hmm. But when you walked in, I said, you've trimmed it up. Yeah. Yeah. I want to shave it off, but. You do. You want to go back to bare face. Not bare. Just, you know, trimmed down. Listen, I'm doing what the lady says. Exactly. If I cut this thing off, I'm just going to look fat. Yeah, me too. So I've been hitting the gym. <laughs> You've been hitting the gym. I love what, it. You were, once, like, once, you were like, come work out with me. I'm just like, once oh, I can see my, see my ding ding again, the beard's coming off. <laughs> <laughs> you are not that fat. I was. You really you couldn't see it. Well, when I, I, wonder I, I mean, I, I had ballooned up. I, you know, I got, I got my pregnancy weight on. Well, you then know? you also have that back so injury. I got the back injury. So you can't and like I bend put, over far oh, enough. Oh man. When I got the injury and couldn't walk for a month and then was on the cane, mm -hmm. I was just depressed and eating like shit and eating late. And, uh, yeah, I put on a crap ton of weight. And so I couldn't see my ding ding. <laughs> you are saying ding ding. Dick. <laughs> cock. <laughs> penis. <laughs> You could thrust see hammer. Oh, so but you're saying that the main um, impotent, impotent impetus. <laughs> I don't think it's the right even word. Right word. Wow, we're it's tired and yeah, I'm tired. Uh, it's tired and I'm late. Um, <laughs> is to be able to see high on tired. It's to be able to see your penis. Yeah, it's a good reason. Okay. Yeah, when you can't see it, you're like, oh fuck. Well, you get a mirror. No, when you look down to take a leak and can't see it. I have to do some sit-ups for, for myself. <laughs> what is your, so do you have a, uh, like a, a morning workout when you're not at the gym? Do you do sit-ups, crunches? What do you do? I alternate. Yeah. So, um, the local YMCA mm -hmm. is right down the street from us. I know. Uh, it's I had an awesome place. It's cool because, um, they also have a kid zone so you can drop your child off and they have like, you know, people that are like mm. people there that watch the kids right. while you do a workout or if you're taking karate class or whatever there for an hour and a half so i do treadmill for uh incline treadmill for like 30 minutes mm -hmm. get sweaty um i try and run but my knees are so bad that yeah. it's rough yeah anyways um and then one day i'll do chest and shoulders the next day i'll do legs and the next day i'll do back which also does some arms and chest and whatnot so i rotate and then rest a day and try and do that so I try and stay on that, and then, uh, I've been trying to eat better. Sure. Know? No, I've done a little you bit know? of that. Although yeah. I did eat half a pizza for dinner tonight. I did yesterday. I was so I did it, and then I was bummed instantly. I'm like, "Fucking Pagliacci, <laughs> you son of a bitch!" Like, I don't know. We had half a Pagliacci pizza. I did the chicken uh, seasonal, oh. the barbecue chicken. I'll oh, see. I go just it's straight cheese. Yeah. Well, you That's don't need me. I can. I you'll dabble. I will dabble, but yeah. um, with pizza, I like to keep it just clean, look simple. Oh, yeah. okay. I like to go cheese pizza. That's my go-to. Yeah. There's this awesome guy on the Instagram that I follow, <laughs> Barstool Presidente, <laughs> and he's a sports caster type figure on the East Coast. Anyways, every day he does this pizza review and goes in and gets a slice from somewhere wherever he's traveling oh, nice. and he, he, he like it's and he rates it it's it's funny and comical and he has like this tagline like uh what's that how does he say one bite or first rule one bite or something like that I don't know. yeah i don't know what he says um, <laughs> it's incredible but yeah mormon mike and i we were going to do a a video series on youtube where we go through all the different frozen pizzas that you can get at Whoa. the store yeah, and basically rate them, like cook them and rate them, like go through the whole like presentation of the package versus what it looks like on the nah. inside and uh, just go with the cheese version of each one, you know? And it, it's, it's one of those things where we're both like, yes, we're definitely going to do that. We haven't done it yet, nah. but we'll get around to it. Do it. Yeah. It's a Doug Lawless thing. Put it on the cost cast pod. Put it on the podcast. Fucking put, wait, put it on the cast. <sighs> put it on the cast. That's, that's going to be one of the catchphrases. All right. We've done it. Thanks, y'all. Now, we've, now I, I will selectively go through and edit out the parts of this last part. Like an hour and a half of it. Since the handshake. Of, yeah. Basically. And like the first half where I'm just like, oh, that happened? Oh. I can't, yeah. Maybe? Cool. So, oh, yeah. Oh, the bomb. Yeah, that's right. Brad. That's oh, right. Cool. I got blown up by skids. Yeah. That oh, happened. Fuck. Terrorism. Oh, no, really. Fuck ignite. Domestic terrorism. Yeah. Oh shit. Oranges in the butthole. Cool. <laughs> Real fucking awesome. Way to go, Pettybone. <laughs> fuck. Oh. 
brother. Man. Did I do okay? You did great. This is fine. This is great. All this right. is, dude, this is Catch the, up. this is episode 30. 30. You know why? In the box. Fucking straight edge. Well, there you have it. All right, we finally returned and uh, done it. Episode 30, John Pettibone Part 2. Okay, so we're not done. Like, we shook hands, but the episode's not over. There's way more. It's going to come after this part, so keep listening if uh, if you feel like it. Um, yeah, I'm going to say that you will definitely miss some of the heart of the episode if you don't keep listening. So uh, it's, a, it's your choice, of course. You can always turn this off. I mean, I'm just assuming you didn't turn this off an hour into it. All right, a couple of things to do. We got to do a little bit of business on this episode. Things that we did not get exactly right or we don't know if we did. So we didn't know exactly when the first Warped Tour was or if it was actually the first Warped Tour. We said maybe 94 or 95. It was 1995. It was the first one. Bands that played that were Quicksand, Civ, Orange 9mm, Sick of It All, um, and then a bunch of others, L7, Face to Face. Uh, that was the first, that was the start, um, and it ended, uh, I believe it ended in the last year. But yes, 95. Alright, and uh, the only other thing that I have noted down here is John tells a story about Death Cab for Cutie playing the song Cutting Away by Undertow. And I believe he said that the song was played on the radio. Here's the correction after doing a little bit of research on this. As far as I know, it wasn't played on the radio, but Mark Holcomb says he definitely did hear that story from the bass player from Death Cab for Cutie. That would be Nick Harmer. I guess they talked to New York and Nick told him that they had played that before and not only that, that somewhere there was a recording of them playing it. So it wasn't aired on the radio but it does exist. I don't know if we'll ever hear that. I would certainly be interested in hearing that. But you know, I mean, it's such an obscure thing from their point of view. I mean, maybe there'll be some kind of strange compilation of singles and odd tracks or something that'll come out someday. If that was actually recorded fully by them in a studio and it wasn't just a practice tape, that would be unreal. So that's basically it for the episode. I'm sure we made a ton of other mistakes, but I just didn't note them, so they won't be here. As of right now, I've got three more episodes of this podcast in the can, and it's just a matter of getting uh, time to edit them. When time is a premium right now, with all the projects I have going on, which I can't totally mention here yet, I might uh, hopefully be able to tell you something about what's going on with me a little bit further down the line. It's all good, though. All right, one last piece of business. Earlier, at the beginning of the episode, I talked about Boris Schleinkofer's books and his audiobook in particular, so I'm going to go ahead and leave you here with a sample from that book. Give it a listen. And if you like it, click that link on the webpage for this episode. Sign up for that Audible trial. They're not a sponsor of the show, but his thing is through Audible, and uh, I'm promoting him, so it just works out that way. All right, here we go. There was the constant threat of the next wave crashing down on my head at any second. I was drowning slowly. And then something happened. I was combing my hair in a dissociative fog when I felt a hand on my shoulder and my mind cleared up. And when I turned to see who was there, I was alone and for the first time realizing the danger I was in. That night, instead of drinking the poison punch, I palmed the cup and brought it and the sleep juice up to my room ungulped. That night, I did not drink the Kool-Aid. Instead, I waited until everything had gone quiet, and when I heard the old lady's step letting herself into my neighbor's room, I made my move. I knew I had to go, to go immediately, or I risked being next in line for whatever foul thing was visited upon them and I took my glass of poison and I got the hell out of there. It would be bragging to recount my creepy crawling skills, so I won't bother. This podcast is a product of the Nobody's Knows Podcast Network. Executive Producers David R. Larson and K. Drake Streetman. Music for this episode provided by Polymorph from the record Artifacts, Demos, and Debris.
Yes. Where you at? Wait, who are you asking? The sellouts. <laughs> Where are you guys? Where are you at? <laughs> Hitting that red line, son. <laughs> talking about so the, much, the yeah. red line on the hot <laughs> <laughs> There's so many red lines on that recording. <laughs> we've got, oh God, uh, we've, we've got the TJs. Yeah. <laughs> so crazy. Someone used to call this getting sea monkey. Yeah. That was a bone. You know what? Thing. We're going to switch this. Let's talk about you. What are you talking Wait, you want to switch it up to yeah. me? Yeah. There's someone, Carl did half of a podcast with me where he interviewed mm-hmm. me. Yeah, yeah. So what do you want to talk about me? Um, so on that one, you, you, you talked about you, the skate shop. You don't um, think I don't jump in and throw in my own stories oh, through all of these for podcasts sure, for all sure. the time. You get down here and you're working at Kinko's, mm-hmm. putting the records out. Sure. What made you want to start doing a record label? Oh God, I don't know. You don't know? Yeah, I do. I couldn't do anything. I wasn't, I wasn't good in bands. I wanted to find a way to contribute. Okay. So I was doing the zine. Yeah. And... Then the zine just morphed into, as you learn to do different things, Mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I have this skill set. Like the idea that like cutting and pasting and photocopying and using a typewriter, because I didn't have a computer at the time, Hmm. that this was a skill set that I had developed. (laughs) Oh, I make flyers for shows too. Okay. I've got this crappy camera. I'm taking these bad pictures, but I'll take two rolls of photos and find one where there's a cool enough picture that I can use on this flyer and this zine. And as this went, and I just kept getting better at stuff and learning how to use different things, and I'm like, well, I could probably figure out how to do a record. And once I had that in my head, yeah, I just wanted to do it, yeah. you know? Yeah. So the first thing was supposed to be a compilation, because <clears throat> I always thought in terms of compilations, that's why I put out so many of them over yeah. the years. And I was, it was going to be first step, and it was going to be like all local stuff. Right. And the only band that came through was 1007. Mm. And Matt went nuts. Like, he was just, like, throwing, sending me stuff in the mail, call me all the time. Like, he was just like, you're the guy. And he just became my guy, Mm. you know? And so I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do a compilation because I don't think I'm going to get anything from anybody else. Let's just do a 1007 7-inch. So. Boom. And then once I had it, you know, then I'm like, okay, and now... Go. Oh, Water Street. These guys were take charge. Uh, These are guys from, like, Tyler's from Bellingham. You know, I should do this. And then... I meet John Lisa and I'm like, let's do just something with, you know, with sleeper. And it just went from there. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So I don't think six months before I started doing the label, I would have told you I was ever going to do a record label. Yeah. It just yeah. happened. Then you're in it. Yeah. Is there a band that you wanted to do that didn't get to? Sure. Who? Galleon's Lab. Oh, wow. Yeah, I would have loved to have re-released the Galleon's Lap in yeah. some way. Yeah. Um, the resolution thing never happened. Yeah. Um, there's a few. There's quite a few. Mm-hmm. I wanted, dude, man, I tell this. Okay, I wanted so badly, and I pitched it hard. I wanted the Blood Brothers mm-hmm. when they were first out, like first seven inch, right? Before they were. Well, no, they did this. Were they were doing Vade? They were called Vade before. Well, I think that was different because there's a. No, they were doing Blood Brothers because they were okay. they were playing as a Blood Brothers, okay. and they they had the split with Stiletto. Is that right? Okay. And then they had their their seven inch, the first one that's got like, uh, God, oh, is it right? Red blooded American girls. Is that on there? I, mm. They were just I liked their thing a lot, and so I kept telling Cody, I'm like, dude, write ten one minute songs. I want to do a ten song Blood Brothers seven inch, mm. and I was like. At the time, I kind of just only, I wanted to do these crazy records. I'm like, I would love to do only seven inches that had 10 songs on them. And of course that went away, but that was one that I kept pitching hard. Like I really wanted, I wanted that and it it just never materialized. And maybe he would just, you know, humor me, humor me a little bit to talk about it. But mostly I think there was like, no, we're totally not going to do that. I'm like, come on, (laughs) why can't I talk you to do that? That would be so cool, man. And here's the thing, man. I think if right now there was this weird limited release on excursion that was a blood brothers 10 song seven inch it would be sick yeah i would I love it so mm-hmm. i wish that had happened um i could have put out a hundred rocky vote a lot of records and would have been thrilled yeah <laughs> you know sure. and i had an opportunity to do a little bit with that but yeah. even to this day i we always um michael ann and i periodically bug rocky we're like we need to do like a singles club with you oh fuck he does, yeah. like, a, a monthly record yeah and, uh, Dude, he's killing it. Oh, I think I brought it up. I think I brought it up in his podcast. Yeah. Here's the thing that I know that Rocky has forgotten. 
So Rocky has recorded so many songs, mm-hmm. he doesn't even know like what there still is. Really? There's like a vault of songs no that he hasn't even looked at. So yeah. I loved the idea of going, like, so the first, there's a 12 song record that came out first. Mm-hmm. They recorded 24 songs for that. Oh. And yeah, I remember them I'll telling me that at the time and just, you know, well, we picked 12 of them. Okay. I think at the time it was like, well, that's what Springsteen does, you know, whatever. Yeah. But there's all these other recordings. And when I bring it up, April will jump in and be like, oh, no, don't you remember? You also recorded those three songs that you didn't do anything with at the Paradox. Oh, and you shit. also did this. And there's these leftover songs. Yeah. So I love the idea of him recording a new song like every month mm. and then doing an A side with the new song. And then the B side is one of these like one of these randoms from the out from the past, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but it's not going to happen. I don't do a record label. Yeah. And the turnaround times on things now, I don't uh, think you can insane. see. And it may have changed. I don't know. Yeah. It, I, I'm just not, I'm focusing on writing. Yeah. And it's moving ahead. Things are happening. Mm-hmm. That's literally my, Hell yeah. I guess if you're going to call it a career, yeah. that's my career now. Right on. So um, I just don't think I'm going to do more records. But you know what? It's always possible that I'll hit some place where I'm happy with where I'm at decide i want to start doing records again Who yeah knows? of course yeah how did die down come around shit die down was i think it happened because of bowling we were going when i just bowling when i first moved down to seattle mm-hmm. from bellingham i was just hanging out with mark and ryan and ron all the time yeah and we were going bowling a lot straight edge bowling <laughs> and uh yeah so then die down i don't know happened. i yeah i that should have got released well, the the one song that we recorded is on the Universal Choking mm-hmm. Sign. Comp. Yeah, but you so, had four songs. Five? I think totally. I think in in total, if you did all, because we kind of had two versions of Die Down. Mm-hmm. I think there were four or five songs total. And yeah, a couple of them were pretty good, man. I think they're all good. I don't know. They're rad. That show when we went when we went up north uh, to Canada. Yeah, that was the last Those time are, we played. Yeah, they were really good. I think that was as good as we got. I was playing, uh, playing with Thorkelson stuff up there. I mm-hmm. think, yeah. Stra- and we that was with Strain. Yeah, yeah. Die down. It was cool. I don't know that it could have been more than it was. Yeah, but it was fun. Like yeah. I've never been a musician. The fact that I was able to Fuck get on a stage either. with those guys and actually pretend, like you know, yeah. shocking to me. I've been in a <laughs> bunch of bands and they were all bad, except <laughs> except they weren't. Well, Sometimes they were kind of good. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, Screwjack was fun. Yeah, Screwjack was awesome. I can't, we were called. How'd that come about? We kept trying to do a band. Jake, Jake and I kept trying to do a band. So the the actual thing that happened, it wasn't called Screwjack. It was called Lit, mm-hmm. right? So what happened Still was the demo. Oh, with the <laughs> with the Evil Dead deer mm-hmm. on the front, um, Evil Dead Two mm-hmm. deer on the wall. So, um, State Route went up and they played in Victoria, mm-hmm. and they told the Booker a lie. They said, uh, and Todd Graham was in the band and they said, we have another band that we're just putting together. It's like this, but way more like mellow, Mm. like it's way quieter. And the guy was like, oh, could you guys play a show in, I think it was in in two weeks. It it was two or three weeks, right? Uh Could you do it? And at the time we were trying to do a band called Wish in One Hand, because I've I've tried Mm. to do a band called Wish in One Hand for like 20 years it's just (laughs) never happened right it's never come together and so when we had kind of given up on it and we tried to couple greg bennick played drums for us for one practice uh ty arlo came out and played drums for us one practice and since dan dean was involved in the in this whole fiasco um he was like okay i'll play drums hold on that's the dog scraping at the oh, door shit <laughs> so, it was the weirdest sound um he was like okay i'll play drums if we're gonna try to throw something together we literally have to write a set and get up there to play so we called it lit mm-hmm. and we and so they were like we said it was super quiet so we're just gonna just write just insane <laughs> screaming amazing like fast garbage yeah. and what are you gonna sing about i'm like i don't know bud dwyer killing himself they're like perfect <laughs> yeah. like, what, that? What, else you, what else are you gonna sing about uh, i don't know like just ho- every horrible thing i can think about just like yeah. just the most negative shit uh-huh. so we were doing it and then i remember the breakthrough for me that happened was i was actually still trying to like sing and uh jake was like no listen just let it go, man. Just scream like you're angry. Scream like you're screaming at someone in a fight. Just like, huh. just, I don't want to hear it sound like you're trying to sing. Yeah. 
and everything changed at that practice. It was like, boom, whatever. It is what it is. It's just, a, I like it. Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of it in a way, although I don't like the word pride is like something that bothers me mm-hmm. these days, but, um, you know, I'm happy that it came out the way it did. Yeah. But from that practice, on, I'm like, oh, okay. I think I understand now. I'm just going to scream so hard. It gives me a headache and yeah. it makes me think my eyes are bleeding. Yeah. Awesome. And we had fun. And then we went up and played that show. It was a great show. <laughs> and they were like, this is not a quiet band at all. Uh, what's that name from? Lit or Screwjack? Screwjack. So Lit, I just thought it sounded so, cool. Yeah. Right? It was at the only show as Lit? No, I think we played two or three. Okay. Because the, the demos we sold at an old firehouse show played in the corner. Oh, that's right. That was a, that right. was a good show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then what happened was is that that fucking band Lit from L.A. Oh, that's right. Had that song yeah. with like Pamela Anderson in the video. <laughs> My own worst enemy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, he's singing about driving drunk and shit. It's garbage. Yeah. So I was super pissed. So Screwjack was... Um, so Hunter Thompson, Hunter S. Thompson would release these books. And then, like, you know, in the beginning of a book, it's like other books by these off- mm-hmm. authors. There was like one book or two books that said he had a book called Screwjack. But it wasn't available. Hmm. And then apparently what it was is he had made a special book with three stories in it just for friends. Oh, shit. So I'm like, let's call our band Screwjack. Yeah. Because it's named after a book that you can't get, yeah. right? And I love Hunter Thompson. Yeah. Um, Look, there's a picture of him up there. Booge. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> hey, Hunter. So um, a couple years later, after the band was done, he actually released Screwjack as an actual book. Oh, shit. I think it's... Oh, I was going to be so happy if I could just pull my copy of it out and show you. <laughs> it should have been sitting right there with my other Hunter S. Thompson books. Yeah. But it was funny because at my 30th birthday, Jake gave me that book. Oh. <laughs> he was like, hey, look, there's a book with yeah. the name of our band. Crazy. Um, it's just whatever. I don't think that that's that interesting. But it's oh, thank you for asking. So. For sure. <laughs> What's your favorite record of all time? Oh, God, really? Yep. I, oh, well, I'm just doing this on Facebook right now. What do you top, mean? Top 10 records. You oh, want to you know are. my... my well, s- I don't have Facebook, so... Is it possible to do my single favorite record of all time? I mean... Sure. <sighs> it is. Dude, it's always been seven seconds in the wind. Hmm. It's just too... Because it's just too... Fuck. <laughs> it's such a hard it's question, It's one of the first man. records I owned when I had it's a record It's such player. a hard question. There's so many. Yeah. But that is uh that is a record that it's the the thing is it's just it's just it's it's an important record. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Then yeah. you start getting yeah. stuff like the Cure Standing on the Beach. Oh, for sure. The cassette version. Like mm-hmm. honestly, like better than that, mm. I don't know. Is yeah. it my favorite? Yeah. And then honestly, you ready for some some wild shit? Yeah. <laughs> you looking scared. What's that gonna be? If I talk about Indigo Girls? No. For real. I love the Indigo oh, Girls. Sure. Okay. But no, that's not what I'm what I'm gonna say. Okay. But honestly, like, dude, I am a sucker for Taking Back Sunday's first record. It's a good record. Tell All Your Friends. Oh, yeah. Is in, like, when I look back at the end of my life and mm-hmm. all the records that I loved, I may have put more time in with that record than Whoa. anything. Wow. Start to finish. Yeah, I yeah. love that record. Mm-hmm. And I've had people tell me in the last couple of years, well, here's the thing. One, it's not age appropriate, right? But I've loved eh. it for I've loved it for like fifteen years now yeah, since yeah. it came out. But yeah. even then, yeah. I was older yeah. than that record's target audience. For sure. But it felt like nostalgia yeah. for feeling away. Oh, for sure. You know, and that's why I connected no. to it so much. Yeah. I connected to a lot of those bands, even I mean, you're saying age appropriate. Yeah. Like, because Leah loves that shit and she grew up in Philly. So oh, yeah. she was there when it was there. I mean, when I was living in Jersey, that those kids, I was seeing those kids young, like mm-hmm. Saves the Day and that whole scene when they were like young, young really Thursday, young, yeah. really young, because you know, they all looked up to the Ensign really guys starts and all that to stuff. Hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I move back, all that stuff pops, the Get Up Kids and all that shit. Well, oh, Get Up Kids. I will. I'll do Something right home about is a close one, too. <sighs> They're playing fucking Numos in a couple weeks. I know. I can't. I, I went to that Crocodile show. I lost my mind. I don't know if I can do it to myself again. I'll tell you this. Like <laughs> another funny story, Super dirty. but I, who gives a fuck? I fucking <laughs> love it. And those records touch something and yeah. it doesn't matter when it saves the day came through. I mean, they'd always play the club and yeah. they got big and then they, you know, came back yeah. down and they were playing core zone. And at that time, uh, you know, Lee and I are together. And she's super psyched. She loves taking back Sunday loves yeah. knows all the fucking lyrics, saves day, all that stuff. 
and we have a connection in that stuff. But she, she had found those bands on her own, you know. So, you know, uh, saves the day is playing the club, and they're doing one of those gimmick shows of like playing the one record or most of the one record, and it yeah, was the yeah. um, what was the through being cool? Sure. I I was actually not a Saves the Day fan. Oh, okay. I, I, I that record's awesome. And I lost my shit and I was fucking stage diving. <laughs> and I I when I lived over there, I was kinda got buddies with them and stuff and whatnot and, and asked to be their manager once. And I was like, I don't know anything about managing. <laughs> Sorry, dudes. And so I've had a connection with those dudes and, and those those Jersey kids. And so, you know, they're there playing and they're, you know, playing the old songs and, and you know, they kind of don't want to do it, but they kind of yeah. need to because yeah. people want to hear it and I'm losing my shit and Leah's there and all of her friends and Leah's losing her mind because she's like, this is awesome. I'm fucking watching Saves the Day again. My dude's stage diving to him. Who's 40. <laughs> What's he fucking doing? He's the only guy being that asshole, but with a smile on his face. And I come back and her and all of her work friends who all like are just like Leah's laughing, but all of her friends are just looking at me like I'm the biggest dick. <laughs> it's so funny. And I don't give a shit. And then, you know, a year later, get up kids plays crocodile. So excited. Cause they're going to play fucking the old stuff. And Leah loses her mind and fucking goes to try and fucking go mosh, you know. And it's just like, so when you say that that talk, taking back to that record's fucking awesome. Like it that is, I, and it's someone said to me recently that um, the lyrics are unacceptable. Why? It's a lot because of because of the age. No, or, because a lot because it's most of the lyrics about are about a singer's relationship with a woman, uh-huh. and um, and about aren't, and aren't, it was a it was not a good. I mean, it was, there's a lot of like, tr- like, it's almost like trauma experienced through the relationship kind of stuff. And okay. it's, some of it is like, almost like bragging about bad behavior. And then some of it is like admitting to bad behavior because of how he really feels. And some of it is like, it's just, oh. it's just a bunch of like, really, the lyrics are pretty fucked up, yeah. but see, that's actually what is awesome about yeah. the record. It talks about like, if you're going to say that that record is real that those are real things right like that's maybe that guy's expression of how he felt about a time in his life or mm-hmm. whatever um but i relate to it like there's some part of me that felt like some of the things that come across yeah. and that's why i love that record so yeah. much but if you're going to tell me that you know that you can't like that because of the ideas that have come across there then well we're gonna have a real problem with metal mm-hmm. with metal lyrics right oh, there's sure. a lot of stuff metal bands like yeah like you know the idea so that sketchy there there is mistakes about early relationships on display in that record tell all your friends Mm -hmm. it's part of what makes it amazing Mm -hmm. for sure so i mean fuck if it's gonna go down it's gonna what are most records lyrics about a relationship well sure but we're in in every record fucking i've done yeah we're in an era where there's there's been a lot of like a lot of understandable yeah for sure and it's coming out and good (laughs) it sure is and yes it is good you know you know, and certainly, I mean, the last couple of years were rough locally, you know, the end of mm-hmm. Rainfest and the things yeah. that went down around that. And so that was where some of this discussion came out of. But I'm okay. just not, listen, I'm just not giving up on everything that I, I'm not going to go and decide that I know that there was something toxic that inspired the lyrics of Taking Back Sundays, Tell All Your Friends. Mm-hmm. That means I can't listen to it anymore. Right. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I would. I mean, if, it, if something did come out, I probably would. But yeah. I don't know, man. And this, the guy, the singer has come out and said that, has named these toxic things. No, not the singer, of the band? Yeah. I'm just saying that, like... Or oh, people God. are taking it. Yeah, the com- this, it was a and conversation in a poker game. But it has come up on multiple times with dudes that I hang with, whether or not it's still an okay record to listen to, you know? Uh-huh. And it's, like, just stuff like little things like no one has to know about this. Things like that. So, let's look at it from the perspective of, okay... Plenty of guys have been super sketchy with the idea that they were having like a secret relationship with anyone. We've got to keep this quiet. This is just sure. between you and me. Yeah. That's some toxic shit. Yeah. Like there's some okay. shit there that's yeah, bad, yeah. right? Yeah. So the guy sings, no one has to know about this in the song. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily what that means, right? Yeah. And here's the thing. It also isn't necessarily saying this is the way to do a thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The whole record is is just like bad relationships on display. Yeah. You know? There's great stuff in there. Mm-hmm. There's cheesy, cheesy shit in there that I love and I'm yeah. never getting away from. Heck yeah. 
You could cut my throat, and with my last gasping breath, I'd apologize for bleeding <laughs> on your shirt. Huh? <laughs> Come on! Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm an old man. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's a good lyric. What about you? What's your favorite record of all time? All time. You asked me that's a hard question. It is a hard question. Um, my go-to? I mean, I mean, probably Louder Than Bomb, Smiths. Okay. That's an, I understand. I always go to. Um here boys don't cry yeah can't name one so i'm sorry i brought up the question but <laughs> it's conversation what's your, but what's hardcore? your what's your favorite movie of all time oh easy dead poet society come in <laughs> mine changes because sometimes i'm gonna tell you it's reservoir dogs and other times i'm oh. gonna tell you it's brick it's been oh, brick yeah. for a long time okay um and then and then I'm like, wow, it was Rushmore for a while. Oh. And I love all those movies. Yeah. Well, but, the... but but honestly, yeah. I think it's Trust by Hal Hartley. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a hell of a movie. Yeah. For a while, I was saying The Road. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that just hit me a certain way. And I was just... See, I... it's a good movie, but favorite movie? It fucking touched me. Dude, I, at the end, I would... You know, I'm fucking in tears. Yeah. Also, I was in a theater with just two other people. Two friends, and we were just quiet. Had you read the book? Yeah. And you didn't mind the ending? No. Because it's different in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I feel... There's a, but there's a lot of movies that have been interpreted from books that are different, and I don't, like, I but separate the two. That's true. I just know? feel like... So I hate to be critical of, like, your favorite film, but I feel yeah. like they missed a really important thing. Up, like, maybe what is the point of the book? Mm -hmm. So... The whole book is the end of the world getting worse, right? Mm -hmm. And there's not going to be any way to survive. Nothing. And there's cannibals and da, da 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 And then in the end, when he passes off the kid, when the kid gets taken by that those new people, the kid notices that the guy has shotgun shells that are homemade, mm -hmm. that were made after the event, right? And they're like, we're people that can help you. And they all have, like, so the I feel like the point is supposed to be that they can make new things and he's with them now. Mm -hmm. So he has actually gotten to the, the dad has died. The dad has sacrificed yep. himself to get him there, yeah. but there will be a new life that will actually, where things will get better. And I think that's the whole point. Why else are they saying that the kid notices that they've actually made new things, you mm -hmm. know, like to me, that's the, that's the point of the story. Like, yeah, but that, and that's not how they did it in the movie. The people that he gets passed off to are just these other kind of like, they, they seemed way, way too weak. Yeah. They're, they're just a family, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, they're just nice people. Yeah. But they're supposed to be, I thought the point was the people who got passed off to were supposed to be hard. Like, but not. Survivalists, yeah. Right. They were, they were not evil. No. But they were going to do like what it took, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I feel you. Still good. I mean, I like the movie mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So killer. I need, uh, but I just saw a quiet place. How was it? I loved it. Yeah. Oh, it was cool. It was a, it was it. a it was a good horror film that I haven't seen or or I haven't liked a horror film in quite a while. But I don't really stay on top of them. Right. Um. Yeah. It was. It was good. It was. It was done well. Yeah, I liked it. What yeah. else did you see recently? Infinity War. Yeah, that's all. Of it's course. Great. Yeah, it's good. I loved it. Um, I don't care. I yeah, love all those still stupid Marvel see, movies. Yeah, I need to, Deadpool 2. I need to see. Yeah, I'm supposed and to go see that with Matsuoka in the next couple Solo, days. And then yeah. we're just supposed to do an episode about it. All oh, right. Awesome. We'll probably come yeah. back with a Deadpool yeah. and a solo episode. Yeah, yeah. Get back on that train. Yeah, yeah. Now that I've got the <clears throat> podcasting setup going again. The table's up. Table's up. Ready to go. This has been a... So we, we're on four we hours were, now? We, well, we were ending this Favorite half show of all again. time. Favorite television show of all time? No. Concert, venue, show, show. Inside Out in Bill's Garage. Oh, yeah. Can't touch it. Yeah. Killer. Then it goes, as soon as we go past <laughs> that, it, it becomes a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Like, then it, then I'm talking Magic Mics and you guys will seaweed it. At, oh, God. And then, no. I mean, Jawbreaker at the party hall, man. Oh, yeah. That was a good Jesus. one. Jesus. And I was so in love with Neurosis them already. at the party hall. <sighs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. There's a lot. Well, what's your favorite show of all time that you saw? That Neurosis one was one. Because that was just, if you could imagine at that time, these guys looking like 
characters out of fucking Road Warrior. Yeah. Playing so loud, so heavy, in a rhythmic groove, tribal-ish. And with the the eerie thought of how life is in Oakland and the shit they fucking, like, they're surrounded around and making a fucking soundtrack for that. They play on a floor and it's fucking epic. And they get through a set, put their stuff down, feeding back, and they walk off. And the crowds, no one's moving. Everyone's still just standing there. Feedback for fucking 10 minutes, maybe even longer. And then coming back and going back into another song, <laughs> like not missing a beat, fucking incredible. And That's awesome. I've never seen a neurosis show where I didn't leave like, why do I play music? There's uh, no reason to, because that's what I aspire to do, even to this day. And I've become pretty close with Scott Kelly, and he's always been one of my like musical influences vocally. And, you know, even though you, I, might, yeah. I don't try and sound like him, but to come across that epically, and he's such a sweetheart of a person, but... Every time I, and I've, that, that's the probably band I've seen the most play ever. I mean, I've traveled to go see them and stuff. Oh, wow. They fucking are just sonically epic and crushing, you know? And, uh, I mean, I've seen them where fuck guitars go out and fucking, they don't miss a beat. They, the band keeps playing. The dude fixes his shit and fucking comes right back in <laughs> with the same anger and rage and like energy that's just fucking inspiring crazy inspiring it's like that band can't do it wrong and they just fuck get better and better with age you know and there's people that are like other oh, new records and eh, like fuck that they get better it's matured but they are it's still fucking intense you know um i respect fucking, neurosis it's never been oh, something yeah, that yeah. i was super into yeah but I, what am i gonna say neurosis isn't a good band yeah, of course yeah, they're yeah. a good band um fuck what else there's been so many swizz at the new city theater yeah, the only show I ever saw there, the only show I, that the, I don't even remember. The they, New they, City I mean, Theater? Was it called the New City Theater? Yeah, it was up on 11th and Pine. It's not there, they tore it down oh. a couple years ago, across from the park, the baseball field. So you know where Numos is, mm -hmm. and then if you were to walk north on 11th, and then you get to... I had no idea there was anything up there. Yeah, it, I think it was the only show ever gone there, and... <laughs> Um, and Swizz played there. Swizz played, and it was fucking incredible. Wow. And uh, there wasn't a lot of people there. And I went by myself, and no friends were there either. I think what it was a was weekday. It? I want to say 90. Mark wasn't there? Anyway. No, he wasn't. I wow. think it was a weekday. Um, But My Name opened. That was a sub pop band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And someone else. And I... Not only was it great, what, sweaty nipples. I feel like if it's my name, they're gonna be playing with sweaty nipples. It might have been, <laughs> but Swizz played last, and it was crazy because Ajax was there. Uh huh. Last gasp, uh -huh. and when he was in his, uh, you know, messed up phase, and he was fucking with them, and the drummer jumped over his drums and fucking rocked him. <laughs> And dropped him, and then he went back to playing drums, and they just kept playing. It was fucking incredible. Nice. That verbal assault show at Washington Hall. Oh God, verbal assault. Yeah, that was Didn't a good one. Um, Fugazi at uh, yeah, Lake City Theater. Yeah, that's a good one. That was a good show. That was just like yeah. There's so many, so many, so many. Who else? I thought you meant favorite television show. What's my favorite television show <laughs> of all time? <laughs> or what I'm currently watching. What are you currently watching? Oh, God. What am I not watching? Um, Atlanta. Atlanta? I don't watch that. Oh, it's, I don't know uh, that one. It's uh, Donald Glover's show. It's oh, good. no. It's Is really it good? good. Oh, yes, I'll check it it's out. It's really good. I'll check it out. I um, watch um, currently what's on Billions. That's on Showtime. I haven't watched it, but I'm supposed to. It's intense. It's good. Um, I like Homeland a lot. Dude, I'm just now into the third season of The Wire. I just so started good. it in the last couple months. Wired was so oh, good. I'm, oh, I'm, man. There's so I have much been out aware. There. There's a comedian that says it's never a good time to yeah. tell someone. Did you watch oh, the Shield? Hold on. This was. Uh, I feel like Pete Holmes, but maybe not. Huh? Uh, there's never a good time to tell someone that you haven't seen The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, his show is fantastic. What is it? Crashing on HBO. Oh, I great. Check that Two out. seasons of it. Wonderful. Oh, okay. Really sweet. Oh, okay. Which is. Mm. 
Like it's his thing. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know he was a genius. Uh. And I got a chance to see him last November in a small oh, wow. meltdown when meltdown was still around. Oh. And I was staying at Dion's yeah. house. Meltdown was around the corner. Yeah. I went thinking it was something else. He wasn't on the bill. Yeah. And it ended up being this last night they were going to have this show in this little room with like 100 people. And because it was the last night and he was just there, he just decided to come do a set. Wow. And I had never thought he was funny. Yeah. Like he had the Pete Holmes show and I yeah. knew who he was, right? Yeah. I think it was funny. And it was the probably the, I can't even tell you the jokes he said or why it was good, but I think it was the funniest stand up comedy thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Everyone was just in tears. Yeah. He was making people laugh. But, you know, a callback is when you, like, mm -hmm. refer back to a thing you did earlier, right? Yeah. The callbacks he was doing were noises and facial expressions. <laughs> and they were flooring people. Really? They were just... Oh, wow. It was so... I can't even explain it. It was so good. And then I went, oh, this is why there's so much hype on him. He's phenomenal. <laughs> and you can't put that, what I just saw, that can't be on TV. Yeah. Like it doesn't make sense yeah. on TV. Right. So then now I start paying attention and listening to his podcast and stuff. And I'm like, ah, oh, he's great. Awesome. So his show his I really like this. I'll check TV it show. out. Yeah. I think my favorite of all time is millennium. Really? Yeah. Okay. That was really, really that was that. dark. You like some dark shit, man. I do like dark shit. Yeah, watch millennium, some neurosis some in the background. Vampires. <laughs> watch it. And then afterwards we'll just watch the road. Yeah. What the <laughs> Hey, like it moves me. I like I like Rushmore. I like he puts uh, on the play at the end. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I like uh, I like when. Uh, but I like Pretty in Pink. It's one of like, my favorite all time movies. Well, that's good. Yeah. Oh, Fuck boy, it. those movies are forever. Will be the duck. Those man. movies are rough, dude. They're great though. No, they're great. I can watch them over and over. When was the last time you watched Sixteen Candles? Probably a month ago. Yeah, you didn't cringe a lot and have some real problems with it no it's so rapey okay thanks for bringing that up <laughs> fuck it's so rapey okay <laughs> great cut, cut this part so out fucking 30 years later now fucking all my john hughes films are ruined <laughs> here's the thing like 16 candles is particularly bad i don't know why like i didn't i had not remembered like you know, I'm, oh yeah, yeah. I remember. He Have takes you had this conversation with someone Why? about Sixteen Candles? Well, this is coming from the Taking Back Sunday record. That's fucking now. <laughs> no, like, so tainted. So I. <laughs> no, but the six. I don't think that, so. My whole argument is this: I don't think the Taking Back Sunday record is tainted. Uh -huh. I think that the Sixteen Candles movie is my memory had cut out the stuff that like I would currently really object to. So the first time someone ever told me that 16 so candles like, was offensive was when Matt Matsuoka told me who loves John Hughes films uh -huh. that he never could like that movie because oh, yeah. of long duck dong for sure. And I went see, and, and I've, I've said this, I think on the podcast before I've said it to him before, yeah. like to me, that was a revelation, right? Yeah. Because dude's a hero. Like the dude's for hilarious. Sure. And I think of him. In, so I guess people, Here's a here's some real white guy dumb shit for y'all. Okay, so just enjoy it. I know. Um, in my head, that's not someone you laugh at. That's someone who you would like to be around. Like, that, he like would been, he, I would have been friends with him in he, high school. He are there, yes. When you first see his face and there's a gong and the parent the yeah. grandparents are making fun of him and oh my god they're freaking what's happening hot stuff yeah. all that stuff. But by the end of that movie, he has had the hero's journey of the Fuck movie. Yeah, yes. Right? Fuck yeah, donger needs sleep. Yeah, but. That doesn't change the fact that it's like trying to defend Apu and The Simpsons right now. Like, although this, I think Donger's much, much worse. I've never watched The Simpsons. Okay. Well, people will understand that reference if they even ever get to this. This but is going to be I know after the end of the... Right. Yeah. So, so I, look, Matt... I understand. I, what am I going to disregard? Matt saying, that upset me when I was younger. That oh, was no. something that bothered me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know the experience of Asian... So, so that's that. Gotcha. But now, watching it, uh -huh. and I'm like... Here's a problem, okay? Our hero character, who we're supposed to relate to, is Farmer Ted. Jake is this, like, super guy that, like, our Samantha character, mm -hmm. our other hero character, mm -hmm. she wants him, right? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. But we've got our supposedly good young male character and our supposedly good older male character mm -hmm. after the party hanging out. Ted's under the table. Class table, He yeah. brings him out. They're hanging out, right? He's mixing him a drink. Talk yeah. to him, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, if I just wanted sex, 
so and so has passed out. I don't remember her name. Oh, passed out yes. in the other room. I could violate her six ways to Sunday. And Farmer Ted says, "What are you waiting for, man?" Yeah. And it's like, see, there's a problem there. Mm-hmm. And so, the young kid who hasn't had any experience or anything, okay. Maybe chalk that up to being over exuberant or trying to be cool or whatever, Mm -hmm. but it sucks, right? So how do we solve it? He sends her drunk ass home with the kid in the car so that he can have sex with her thinking it's him. Yeah. That's just not all of this is. Yes, I realize this was funny comedy stuff, right? But it doesn't fly now. Like, I'm just like, I can't make any more excuses for this thing. It's uh, I get it. It is outside of our norms. Oh, yeah. If you made that movie today. You couldn't. Fuck no. No. (laughs) You couldn't. There's still funny shit in that movie. But uh, is this bumming you out? No. <laughs> I'm enlightened. I don't think Pretty in Pink has the same has the same issue, but I also don't think John Hughes directed it. I think he wrote it. Yeah, he wrote it. it uh, Howard Dutch? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Better, same with Some Kind of Wonderful. Better movies. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't say 16 Candles was my <laughs> favorite. I said Pretty in Pink because I can relate. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> some Kind of Wonderful. Relate. Yeah, Ducky's it's fucking great. Ducky's a screwed up guy. Fuck yeah, but you, under, you understand him. Fucking good hair, dress cool. <laughs> Couldn't Hang, get the girl hanging out with the dice man outside. Oh fuck the dice man. <laughs> fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a shithead for you. He should have been it's in sixteen true. candles. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Dice Clay should have been in sixteen candles. Yeah. Why um, not be the racist uncle? So, did you say Pretty in Pink was your favorite film? One of them. One of them. Yeah. It's in the top five. Except also. Dead, Dead Poet Society. Oh, that's a good one. Fuck, I love that. I fucking have I mean, it's that still got one. suicide and the bummer ending. Hey. But they're standing on their standing on their desks. It's relatable. <laughs> yeah. You know? What do you yeah. do? Uh, I really love that movie Drive. Drive was great. But I love how it kicks that guy's head apart in the elevator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good. Ryan Gosling. Yeah, that's Hot. that's one of my tops. You ever heard his band? No, Dead Man or yeah, he Dead, has a band. Epitaph put it out, or it might be an anti. It's called Dead Man's Bones. It's straight up Nick Cave stuff. It's fucking awesome. You would never. I would have no idea. You would this never. Exists. Yeah, no How, one. No from, one really does. Is it from a long time ago? Mm, or is it you just do it recently? Eight years. It's like dog starts like Keanu's band. Eight, six, eight years. No, it's it's killer. And the whole so it's him, him and his buddy. And they have these songs, and it's very, like, old, campy, carnival-style vibe. Like the, you know, like, piano, ring, dink, 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 dink. Like, think Nick Cavey kind of stuff. Yeah. Not as good, but yeah. but there's children, a children's choir. Oh, weird. In it. And it's just haunting and slow. It's really cool, Tom Waitsy-ish kind of vibe and whatnot. It's fucking cool stuff. And supposedly he's, like, into hardcore. I think I've like heard American this. Nightmare shows and shit, oh, like I've definitely you know that, stuff yeah. like that. Whatever, <laughs> fucking cool, awesome. But supposedly his band only did one tour, and they would go to a city, hire a children's choir, practice with them for the show, play the show, and then move on to the next city. That's what I heard. Not don't know if that's true or not. I wish I would have seen it if it was. Sounds fucking cool. But yeah, drives drives a killer movie. Um, will you will you tour the U.S. again? No. You don't think so? I can't be away from my family that long. Like, it's... Yeah. Eris has done a couple, like, four or five days things, and it's just rough. Like... Did I tell you about... I've done it so much, and... About reverse shoplifting? <laughs> reverse shoplifting? What I always wanted someone to do. Okay. A band. Uh-huh. I, don't, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on here. something that you still have from a tour that you stole you want me to take back for you? No. <laughs> no. I think a band okay. should... Make a copy of a record that oh. isn't distributed anywhere. Okay. Right? Yeah. At all. Yeah. I think you should take the entire pressing, uh-huh. however many it is, just a few hundred. Yeah. On tour with them, they should tour the U.S. And every city they go to, they should go to record stores. And they should leave copies of the records in the record bins, bins. without telling the people that oh. own the store. Yeah. They should <laughs> come in with the records and leave them. All right. And not tell anybody mm-hmm. that they've done this, but they'll be on tour and then people will start, like, imagine if you came into the record store an hour later and you're flipping through the bin and you're like, this doesn't have a price tag on it. And you went to the counter and, like, they wouldn't know if, you know, if they had a system for, they wouldn't know the record was there. Yeah. What are they going to do? Are they going to say, oh, This would have three to bucks? be an established band. Yeah, yeah. A little bit established. It would be cool. It'd be super cool if it was established. If it was an established band, people would catch on quick. Yeah. 
right? It'd, it'd be, be better amazing. if this. It'd be better if this was a band that was they Trying. did it as they were up and coming, you know, or if they were just kind of like yeah, but they appealed to a certain. You're thing. flipping through records, like most of the time, you're like looking for something you're wanting to get, right? So, right. I mean, the fl- people will flip like, right past yeah, it, if right? I'm looking through, and it's. Yeah. What about even better if they like didn't have like the title of their band on the cover or whatever? Here's the thing though. Imagine getting home from tour and then basically going out and being like, "Oh, by the way, we distributed an entire press of your record to record stores all across the country. It's yeah. the only way to get it. Good luck." That would be, be cool. Fantastic. It'd be easy to do it now. And you'd only be able to do it if you were on tour because what are you going to figure out that expense to get that thing done yeah. with, or are you going to try to get all these, you know, people would be, this has to be the only people are in and out of the people of the band <laughs> okay. reverse shoplifting. All right. I'm in. Um, I don't want to do it. Let's, let's, yeah. yeah you're gonna go to <laughs> but um, if anybody wants to do that, that I think that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Rocky. Do it, dude. Living room. He tour. does tour. I just don't know. Like yeah, he's doing, he's out of tour right Killing now. Killing it. Kelly, he's yeah, he's really dude. Really Rocky what a, a lot great of... fucking idea! What the living room tour thing? Yeah, yeah, incredible. It's good. It's you've seen one, Seriously. right? Have you come? I've out? never seen it. They're so good. I dude. want to, but I follow him on his. If stuff, anyone, you know, and it's like if anyone has a chance, good on him because that dude's solid and a sweetheart, and just that idea of doing that thing is just so remarkable. So what we're talking about, if anyone is still listening, yeah, um, is that well, no, so. So here's what I'm going to do, John, yeah. is I'm going to end it where we ended it, yeah. and then I'm going to do my end thing, yeah. and then I'm going to say, oh, by the way, here's there's like another show. hour of show, yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to listen, if you're into it. Yeah. Um, so Rocky, you may have seen Rocky play in a club to you know live to a lot of people, but and most everybody probably knows about this already, but if you don't, Rocky does living room tours, and basically someone agrees to put up their house or their space that they have for a small number of people. It's usually about 30 people. And you've got to buy a ticket ahead of time. So they're usually sold out long in advance. And you get to go see Rocky play a couple of feet in front of you, like right there. And he interacts with the crowd and people. It's just wonderful. Amazing. Like he's, it's essentially everyone's just hanging out in a mm-hmm. room. Yeah. And they're, they're great. And his music lends itself to that kind Completely. of environment. Completely. So, yeah. Very intimate. Very cool. Very cool. Let's right. get out of here. Yeah, dude, you, uh, it is right now midnight. No. Yeah. How late were you supposed to stay out? When midnight breaks. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> okay, that's it. We're done. We're done. Okay. <laughs>